go up to broadcast depth. We're going in. How you guys doing? It's a good day here in Reno, Nevada. Go. Today we're going to talk about plate theory. Go. You guys are probably wondering why the hell I'm talking about this today, but you'll understand in a bit. Go. Stay tuned. Hey, what's going on, guys? How are you? Welcome back to the Rational Mail, our regular Sunday installment. Um, so uh, first off, I just wanted to let everybody know that um, I, I'm not going to, I'll, I'll jump right into the topic this time because I know a lot of people say, well, he, he takes 20 minutes before he gets into the topic. Well, we'll get into the topic today. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk to you guys about, though, is uh, a lot of people think, well, you know, we got it. We have to talk about the, the virus and I'm not even going to call it by its proper name. You know why I'm not going to call it by its proper name? Because if you do, YouTube will throttle you back. That's why. Okay. Let's just let just get this out in the open here. Uh, YouTube and Google and uh, I think Twitter to a lesser extent too. In fact, me just saying this right now will probably get me demonetized or probably get me throttled back because uh, they don't want anybody uh, talking about the virus. Um, so uh, that's that's area number one or or or. I guess article number one here. The other thing is I've talked about this for the last, uh, I don't know, uh, since Wednesday, uh, then we talked about it yesterday on rule zero. Um, and then of course, uh, even gosh, even last Sunday, I think I talked about this a little bit too. Um, you know, things were just developing. And if you guys want to ask me questions about that in the, uh, in the chat, I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have about that. But, um, this show is about, um, you know, red pill 101, right? This is what, um, what, uh, you know, when people get into either reading my book or getting into the red pill, uh, as a, um, as a social thing, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, um, they have a lot of questions. And this is one of the most popular ones. Uh, if you look at the last four or five of my, uh, with the exception of last week, if you look at the last four or five of the shows that I've done um, on the Sunday show, which is today, um, you'll see that I've been doing things like hypergamy. I did uh, what, what is alpha. We talked about that. Uh, just some basic stuff. Uh, I hate to call it remedial, but uh, that's really kind of what it is. That's why we call it Red Pill 101. So, um, yeah, things are, things are going to hell right now. I get it. Um, a lot of people, uh, you know, first thing, first things first, you know, people who get in the chat and they'll go, oh, I can't believe he's not talking about the virus. Ah, help me. Okay. Well, there's a hundred other friggin' challenge channels that are talking about that right now. So if you want to keep yourself plugged in to Twitter, you want to keep yourself plugged into what's going on. If you think that, um, you know, this is the second coming, if you think that, uh, you know, if you, I, I think what's interesting about this is I think that I'll, I'll, and I said this yesterday on, um, on rule zero is it really brings out the nervous birds. And by that, I mean like the nervous birds who are out saying that it's the sky is falling or it's the end of the world. And yeah, it, we've gone through some pretty gnarly, shit in the last you know couple of weeks and it, i don't think it's over and i don't think we're gonna i don't think it's gonna be something that's gonna um just go away anytime soon but that doesn't mean that things don't change we talked yesterday on um on uh, rule zero about uh you know what can you expect in uh, a post virus sexual marketplace you know, people kept saying oh is this the end is this the end of feminism and we, on this very show I've had guys who say, well, Rolo, what's it going to take to reset this? You know, I'll get it from MGTOWs or, you know, I get a lot of people and I know Giuseppe's probably going <laughs> to going to chime in here in a minute because he's he always ends up sending me like, you know, 100 bucks from Australia or wherever he is and asking me, you know, like, oh, you know, please don't promote the idea that we need to take women's rights away. Please don't promote the idea that we need to repeal the 19th. Please don't, you know, like like the 
dude, I don't, I, honest to God, I don't think that's going to happen. And I don't think you really need to worry about that. Because Epi, I know you're going to call in or you're going to hit, hit me up today. But people will always say, though, in the, in the same vein, they will say, well, um, you know, how are we going to, how is this going to change? How is the sexual marketplace going to change? How is the, um, how are we ever going to uh, get back to a point where, you know, men are men and women are women? Uh, and this might be it, right? I, that's, a, you know, the joke has always been this. Well, uh, it's going to take a meteor, right? We're going to need to get hit by a meteor <laughs> or we're going to need to, well, a lot of people say we need another war and I don't think we're going to have another war. And if we do, it certainly won't be anything like um, anything like the wars we've known in the past. The last real war we had, technically, I mean, I, and war as in like there's two opposing nations against one another. Um, I mean, I guess you could, I guess you could certainly say uh, like Vietnam or Korea, but like there, I mean, where people, you know, where there's an actual troop movements and things like, rather than a guerrilla war type thing, um, but. Yeah. Other than that, other than a full scale World War Three, what else can be? What else could possibly do? What else could like reset the clock? What else could push us back? Well, um, you know, uh, if you if you listen to MGTOWs, it's like, well, if we get enough guys to go MGTOW, then women will finally appreciate us and they'll finally come back around. They'll kind of come around and see what great guys we are. No, now we have a now we have a pandemic. Okay, so we have a pandemic. If you if you really want to talk about the pandemic, I'll be happy to talk about that. But until we get to that point, I'm going to talk about the things that people want to hear about they want to know this stuff they want to talk about uh red pill stuff they want to talk about um you know they want to talk about alpha they want to talk about hypergamy they want to talk about so i'm actually going to do a I, i'm considering doing a show on um the soulmate myth and the reason i'm doing that is because i actually uh did a pretty solid chapter of it in the upcoming religion book uh, because i think it's very pertinent to that topic so um what do you got for me here Zol zoltan uh 31m here oh uh, read rational mail. If a girl doesn't want to be non-exclusive, is it because I'm not alpha enough? How do, how long does it take to get good at this? Okay, well, well we're going to get to that, man. We're going to get to that. Uh, I promise I will answer it. What, what, is, what even is an HUF? <laughs> um, let's see. I believe I have, do I have, Sam, do I have you in? I think I do. Yeah, I do. Great. Okay, now I got you. Thank you, Sam, for, Sam is moderating for me today. Tiger the Brave says competition, anxiety, plate theory go together. Yes, they do. Uh, another, wow, you guys are already on top of your game. Do I even need to do this topic today? <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. Please remain and become rational agents. Okay, so I, I, I'll, we're going to get, I'm going to tie all this up with a really nice bow at the end of this. So bear with me right now while we get into um, plate theory here. Um, the first thing is this, is what is plate theory? Okay, play theory is the theory or the idea, um, concept, let's just say, of non-exclusivity. And if you have ever read the 48 Laws of Power, and I, damn it, I knew I should have looked this up too, but the, uh, one of the laws of power is never commit to anyone. It is a, a powerful, I know, I, I, it's, a, it's a law of power. It's being non-committal. And I think that when we talk about commitment, um, usually, in our old order way of thinking, we think of commitment as something that is uh, a concept that is different uh, for men than it is for women. It's very similar to like concepts of love. It's very similar to uh, concepts of respect. There are different approaches and different aspects of those concepts, I guess, um, that apply differently from, from men to women. Again, men and women are not the same. We are different and we have different approaches to different you know, different things. And the problem is, is that we think that there is a mutual understanding. This is the blank slate understanding, which is if I'm the same as a woman, then she must understand honor. She must understand respect. She must understand uh, love in the same way that I do, right? Because if she's just like me, then she must have those same concepts. And so we automatically have this mutual understanding of love and, and it shouldn't matter, right? Love is love. It's not. We have different concepts of love. We have different concepts of respect, and we definitely have different concepts of what commitment should entail to us. Now, when I talked about when I did the show on respect, and this was back in December, I did actually did a two-part blog series. Series, excuse me. Uh, I got my uh, I got bulletproof coffee today. Don't worry, it's not gonna. I won't be all raspy. Um, I did a two-part series in December about uh, differing concepts of respect because. As I was, well, actually, as I am still writing through uh, book four, 
there are it, it occurred to me that just because you know men, if if men and women have different concepts of love it's, could they have different concepts of other other sort of i guess esoteric ideas and the answer is yes of course they do um simply because we don't think the same we have different architecture in our brains we have different ways of, you know we have different acculturations um different gendered acculturations i guess too the way we're brought up uh and raised um as men as women depending on what society you were brought up in yada 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 but there are differences in our approaches to those things and there are differences in approaches to um to commitment and i'll tell you why this is when somebody says like i'm sure you guys have heard this before um when a woman or you hear this on uh you, you'll hear this on like relationship uh, programs. Maybe you'll hear it from a relationship coach. Uh, maybe you'll hear it from uh, a dating coach or really quote unquote relationship expert. We'll say this, they'll say, you know, men are commitment phobic or commitophobes. Have you ever heard commitophobe? That's what I'm, what I'm getting at here. Um, there is a concept of commitment that applies that, that women have that applies to what men ought to be. If they're brought up in any kind of condition of uh, a social, socially enforced monogamy. And you, God, you're going to love how I get to the end of this, but <laughs> keep that in mind though. Um, so what I'm saying here is like, there's, there's lots of different ways that men commit to different things. You can commit to your family. You can commit to the military. Sure. You can commit to your job. You can commit to yourself. You can commit to lots of different things. There's a lot of different commitments we make in this life. Shit, I mean, you could go and uh, say, hey, I'm going to, I, I, I promise, I, the undersigned, promise to pay X amount uh, per month for my car. And that's a commitment. And there's, a, there's lots of different ways of commitment. But if you ask women about commitment and you put it in the same breath as men and commitment, what do you think that means to them? It means long-term commitment. It means uh, commitment to family building. It means commitment to monogamy is what that means. There's a, like when women say, well, you know, men are kiddles. And in some ways, I think they might be right about that. But when they say that, you know, or we'll we'll listen to Tradcon say like, oh, well, you know, these these young men are extending their adolescence and they just want to be Peter Pan boys and they don't want to commit to anything. Well, maybe true, maybe not. Um, if that is the case, it's probably because they see what's going on around them. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand the sexual marketplace today. That's why you get MGTOWs. That's why you get guys who don't want to be committal. They don't want to, you know, now granted, a lot of them don't want to play the game, period. But uh, the ones that do still, you know, it's in their best interests not to commit to anything. And that's that's part of the the fundaments of um, of the for, that the law and 48 laws of power. And, and somebody will go and look this up for me. What is the one that is so, somebody find this in the chat? It is. Um, uh, never commit to anyone. I think it might be law 20. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Um, but in that, uh, there's uh, there's always the reversal at the end of uh, every chapter of the 48 Laws of Power. And at the end of that, of course, the reversal of this is that if you don't commit to something, then people think you're a wishy-washy. They think that you are always going to be duplicitous. They, uh, they think that you're, oh, well, or maybe you're just always out for yourself. Um, I, I'm bringing up the concept of commitment here because it's going to be important later on in this little chat we're having. Um, so, 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 so keep that in mind because what happens is uh, a lot of guys are too eager, I think, to commit, particularly when they're younger, uh, when they don't realize how the game is played, when they don't realize actually the game that they're in. Now, again, Commitment doesn't necessarily have to be to a woman. It can be to other things. And so sometimes the younger you are, um, and I don't know if I've ever, I think I've probably talked about this before, but um, when a human being, uh, male or female, um, goes through puberty, goes through puberty, gets into becoming a, a young, young adult, let's say like right up until they're 20, 21 years old, they're still developing the capacity for abstract thinking. That's one of the reasons why, like, if you have a 16-year-old, particularly if it's a boy, <laughs> if a 16-year-old boy and you're trying to insure them for, uh, for a car here in the U.S., it's way, way more expensive. In fact, it becomes le only becomes less expensive over time where you prove yourself as a good driver, you make good decisions, you're not getting any tickets, you're not any accidents, those kinds of things. Um, because on some level, they understand that, well, first of all, they can make more money off of you because you're probably 
going to make bad decisions and you're probably going to get into an accident and there is the money aspect that is part of that as well but there's also why is it different between say um, a young woman and a young man and there's a difference in in how much if you are female and how you how much if you uh, are male for your insurance for your car insurance why is that well because they do studies they run the statistics they understand you know wh what it is they want to insure what they don't want to insure um but the 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 point i'm making here is that at a, at at a point i talked about this in the the second the second book uh preventive medicine um when a guy gets to be about 18 when he gets to be about 20 maybe 22 this is at the point in a guy's life where he tends to be the most idealistic and this is the point where i tried it when I, when i get a guy who wants counseling during this time it's it's almost it's weird to me that these guys are so ready to get into monogamy they're so ready to uh, and they think they think it's their duty you know they're they're trying to be they've they've swallowed this idea this blue pill idea that they need to um they need to bend over backwards for milady, right? Or they need to, in uh, in some way, like I've I've had, I've actually had like kids as young as like say thirteen, maybe fourteen, will tell me like the best way to get a girlfriend and what you got to do. What it's one thing to say, hey, well, how do you get a girlfriend? But then when you say, how how do you get along with her? How you know what do you who do you have to be? What do you have to do to to be a good boyfriend? And they have very complex, <laughs> very complex ideas. And none of them have to do with like spinning plates. None of them have to do with like being a player. Nine times out of 10, like we, I keep saying is what it was 80, 85% of guys today are very much betas. And they usually, it, it requires some kind of, um, you know, crisis situation to sort of wake them, you know, shake them up out of that. But before that happens, they're very on top of, of you know, what it is that they believe that they have to do you got to keep it fresh you got to talk to her it's communication blah 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 blah. the same kind of stuff that you would i've been hearing since probably the mid 80s uh you know you've got the here's the things you have to do and again it's sort of jumped through these hoops and when guys talk about oh you gotta be a dancing monkey and entertain her and blah all that other stuff yeah sure that's where that comes from and definitely if, if you guys have a, a a gripe with that i'm i'm all ready to agree with you <laughs> because that's where it comes from and it's usually the the onus of the relationship is on that guy and they don't understand why but they do understand one thing that they got it it's it's one guy one girl and that's that's how it works for them and this is the basis of socially enforced monogamy and we're going to talk about that a little bit today too but i have to the, the one of the reasons why that um sp uh, plate theory spinning plates the idea of non-exclusivity dating many women uh, is so offensive to guys. It's, it's rarely offensive to women because women uh, being the you know, primary sexual selectors in certainly in Western culture, but uh, being the one who's, you know, if you subscribe to romantic love, it's women who should do the selecting. At least that's what the, you know, that's just common sense. Well, it's only common sense because you've learned this over the years, whether you've been, you know, read romantic literature or you saw Disney movies when you were a kid or whatever. I mean, this is, this is that blue pill village influence. And when I ask guys this, I say, well, why is it that you think that you should only be with one, one girl, one, one girl, one guy? Why is that? And not, not I mean, hear me out on this i'm i'm not saying i'm not i'm not promoting the idea of poly we're going to get to poly and poly and or uh, poly, polyamory here in a little bit but what i say is like why is it that you want to be exclusive why most guys are um particularly the 80% of uh, beta guys tend to be what are called serial monogamists and that's the idea the concept of serial monogamy begins when they're teenagers because they've been fed this stuff this this disney stuff and you know I, I meant to to dig this out, but there's a um, there's a video out, and I think it was by the same same chick that did um, the masks of masculinity. There's this documentary on like, oh well, you know, guys are not really masculine. They would all be like, you know, emotional girly pussies if they were allowed to. And it's just this, you know, masculine society that makes them, you know, that bullies them into, you know, trying to be more conventionally masculine, which is absolute horseshit. But it's the same. The same, uh, the same chick. I can't remember her name. The, the director, the producer of that. She was like, um, she had done another video, and it was her interviewing boys as young as like seven, six or seven, and they would ask the boys, 
what it and you'll find this in my my, my book uh, positive masculinity the third book um they ask them why what is it what makes a guy what makes you a boy like what makes a man a man uh, they ask that later on but they will go to like boys as young as seven like what's what's the best thing what's the worst thing about being a boy and then and little boys are like you can tell like when they're six or seven years old they want to get on the playground and they'll tell you yeah it's it's this and it's it's sports and it's fun and they're running around and it's like it's almost like this natural um organic understanding of like who they are as little boys and then when they get to like 10 or 11 years old shit changes and that's when you get like the, the little boys go well you got to be nice to girls you got to do and, and you can see like from seven years old to 10 years old and then from like 10 or 12 on up to like 14 or 16 and you can tell the mindset changes but just in those little and, and these are you know young kids right they're this demographic and you can tell how they have absorbed this village understanding of what it is what it what they should be doing or or how they should either be ashamed of themselves like in the in my uh my third book positive masculinity uh i post there's a, a picture in there and it is um it is this this list of uh, i guess the these i think they were nine years old nine year olds so they would it's prior to middle school and they were asking boys like what's the worst thing about being a boy and then of course they run down the list of like well you can't have babies and you can't and everything that was bad that they listed about uh being a boy was something that was good about being a girl and so I, the reason i'm coming out and I'm, I'm talking about this is because this indoctrination i guess or this uh, this embedding this mindset in guys starts very very early and i know i say that all the time i know i say you know what starts when they're five years old that you know kids of five years old are little sponges right they 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 just out their surrounding anything that's going on so if it's good or it's bad they usually take it in and they process it with their little you know little kid brains because they again they can't think in abstracts at that point but that's a very like pivot if you know anything about child psychology that's a very pivotal part in a in a human being so certainly a child's development and they absorb that stuff so when you are when you're exposed to disney all the time particularly the same themes and the same messaging that disney has been really kind of pumping for a very long time and i i'm i'm, I'm hitting on disney there's other other you know ways that that the village i guess influences our kids but i'm focusing on boys right here because when those guys get to be 18 when those little five-year-old boys get to be 18 they've already got a, an idea about what it is that is expected of them that is usually embedded in their brains in their hind brains by the village by pop culture by disney by their schools by their primarily female teachers um all of these uh influences that go in like no yeah i'm sure you've heard the t the term no man is an island right so when well, what that really means is like it's it's uh, although i've said this before like uh, for instance i i don't believe in a blank slate i think that's pretty much settled as far as i'm concerned there's no such thing as a blank slate but that's not to say that there isn't such a thing as social influence i don't believe in social constructionism like as a strictly standard thing i'm not saying that that societies and cultures and families and everything don't have an influence on them. they do but there's also a natural side of who we are and what we become as a result of that too and i think that that gets thrown out the window because everybody wants to just focus on one thing is it nurture or is it nature so when a, when a kid gets to be about 18 this is where those expectations come out and i know this because it's true myself and i know that big because pretty much every young man that I talk to anywhere between the ages of like, say, 16 and about 26, like that 10 year span right there, usually they tend to be very, very idealistic. And that's where I came up with the idea that men tend to be idealists, particularly when it comes to love. So when a, when a guy is about 18 years old, his idealism is such that he feels like he wants to get into a relationship. But the problem is, is that this is a really critical time, like when, when a and when a guy is like, say, 23, and a woman is 23, she's already at her sexual value peak. She's already at her sexual market value uh, apex, let's just say. And she's learned her agency. Uh, let's just say if she has maximized her potential, because guys are going to say, well, what if she's fat? 
well, okay, well, not, let's just say that her maximum potential is right about that time. Certainly for fertility, certainly for youth, certainly for beauty, all of the things that men select for with respect to a, a mate, a wife, a mother of their children, or just women they want to bang. Okay. Uh, that's your peak potential years. I should probably put that. If I was to revise any of those, those, uh, those old, um, uh, graphs, the graphs that I'm known for. Um, I've always pegged uh, women's peak sexual market value years as about 23, maybe maybe 22, depending, somewhere in there. And then for guys, it's usually around 36 to 38, somewhere in there. And it's not because I think those guys are where, you know, like women are just beating down the door to get to those guys. I'm just saying it by that age, if they have followed their maximum potential, that will be their their primary years where they're going to, um, they will be they will be at the peak of their sexual selectivity if they are. So, moving on, when guys are about eighteen, they don't necessarily want to be players, right? In fact, for the most part, if they've been brought up in a westernized culture, they're taught that to be a player is a bad thing. That we get that girls don't want that guy. Um, this is one of the hard things for guys to wake up from when they are unplugged from the matrix is they tend to still have that idealism. That's why I call it blue pill idealism or from blue pill conditioning. And so the ideals, and you can take idealism, you can do lots of things with it. What this, the past, say, four generations here has done with male idealism is use it for, um, for the purposes of the feminine imperative. And, and fairly successfully, I should add. Um, so when a guy gets to be 18, uh, when he gets to be 21, somewhere in there, um, now he's, he's able to make commitments. And in, and in the long term, these commitments might be a good thing, right? Maybe at 18, now you can join the military. Okay, that's a commitment that you have to make. Maybe, um, <clears throat> maybe you have to join the family business. It used to be that way anyways. Or maybe you have to make a commitment to yourself, to your education. You make a commitment to your ambition, or you can make a commitment to a girlfriend and follow her around the world and do all, you know, and, and put her first, right? You, that's a commitment. And, and what I find fascinating is when women say men won't commit, the time in their lives when they say that, like, you don't hear 23-year-old women say, oh, men are commitment phobic. You hear women who are in the epiphany phase say that. You see women who are like, say, 31, 32 years old, and they go, oh, men won't commit. Well, the reason that they won't commit is because now the, women, the the guys that you want to get with at that time, now that you have decided that you want to you know, get right with God and do things differently and you know that your time is running out as far as your sexual market value is concerned when, in its decline and its decay, now you have a different, the women have a different set of priorities that they have to follow. So there, that's when you will hear women say, oh, men are commitment phobic or men have fragile ego. Or men are afraid to commit. Men, men are are kiddults. You'll see article after I go go look up the the term kiddult on Google. You'll see exactly what I mean. Or or uh, I have a I have a post called uh, "Are You Experienced?" and I I wrote that because there was an article that had said like you know men are not preparing for life after their twenties. Right there, there's this concern that we have this lost boys generation that are. Uh, unprepared to be fathers. They're unprepared to be uh, good husbands. They they don't have a house. They don't have jobs. They or they have or they're not going to college. You know, we 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 lament that you know sixty seventy percent plus of colleges are are basically stacked with women. I I posted <laughs> I posted a uh, uh, some stats from the APA, the American Psychological Association, on Twitter today, um, in a Twitter thread I was I was involved in, and the number of uh, female psych grads is then this was like back in like i think 2015 was three times what it is for men and that was just in psychology i mean there's a i have a, another list of all of these other majors <clears throat> and most of them in the humanities that women are um that women far far outweigh men's enrollment in fact men's enrollment in college is is next to nothing so what we see is we look at oh it's not i say next to nothing but it is certainly less than women so we look at that and we go well men just they this millennial generation they just don't want to commit to anything they're afraid to, they're commitment phobic or we'll look at guys who are midtown and we'll say well they're commitment phobic they don't want him and maybe rightfully so 
but they get they get lumped in with that. They're they're not preparing themselves. They're not they're not doing what we program them to do from the time that they were five years old. They're they're rejecting their programming. They're rejecting their conditioning because if they weren't, they would have already made partner in the law firm and they'd be ready for women once they're done with their party years and they would be the uh, quote unquote uh, equal partners that Sheryl Sandberg says will be uh, over time will be sexier than anything, right? Uh, so when I start saying things like you need to spin plates, like, first of all, where did the where did the idea of spinning plates come from? Okay, well, if you've looked at the thumbnail here, it's it's like the guy who's spinning the plates, right? He's got, um, and I, I should say this, um, you know, from the outset, I didn't come up with the with the term plate spinning. That was actually, I think it was Tom Likas, but I'm pretty sure Tom Likas got it from someone else. But plate spinning has been a thing really since at least as far as I know, since like 2000, 2001, it's, it's been a terminology that's been used. And of course, women say, Oh, that sounds so dehumanizing. How can you refer to them as plates? Well, it's the same thing as game. Why do we, why do we refer to, you know, pickup or whatever? Why do we refer to that as game? Well, because it's, it's a convenient term. People understand it. It's easy to wrap your head around and you move on. Um, there is that. There's also the dissociation factor that goes into that too. It's like, well, it's easier to get rejected from a plate than it is to get rejected from a living, breathing human being. Right? So there's, there's part of that too. It's the same thing. Like I remember back in uh, in the pickup artist days when you had the, what, the three second rule. Like if you didn't go up and approach a girl within three seconds, you weren't going to do it. And they used to have games where like you go out into the clubs and, uh, and granted, this is back in the early 2000s, they go in the clubs and uh, you would try to get shot down. You would try to get numbers. And the, the success was how many girls you failed with because the point was to get you over the fear of approaching. It was a point was to sort of just sort of break you of this mentality that you invest yourself so much into something. And that's where I'm going with this. One of the reasons why plate theory, which means basically non-exclusivity, non-exclusive dating, the problem that that, the, the problem most guys have with that, and the reason why it's offensive to them is because they've gone through a very long time of being conditioned to believe in socially enforced monogamy. That if they have more than one girl at one time, if they're spinning more than one plate at a time, they're bad people. They're bad men for doing that. And I think that one of the things that really wakes guys up later on, once they have a bad experience or whatever, and they end up uh, becoming red pill aware, they see that the idea of non-exclusivity is something that comes very natural to women. It should come natural to guys as well. I mean, you should date like an adult. Most Guys don't date like an adult. And what that means is like having multiple opportunities, multiple people at the same time, um, being able to say, okay, well, if it doesn't work out with Sally, I'm going to go out with Lisa over here, right? Having that, and it's not so much having a backup because I think a lot of guys get, get, get this twisted around. They think that having a, uh, a backup is, is something that like the reason it's been plates is to have the backup. So you don't feel bad. If something doesn't work out with Sally, then you got Lisa to go and, you know, ride you to glory. So that's kind of, I, I understand why guys go there, but that's not really the point of plate theory. The point of plate theory is to experience many women. And that doesn't mean you got to bang every single one. This is the, this is a point in plate theory that most guys particularly the purple pill hacks, particularly the guys who want to throw rocks at me or the red pill or whatever else. They think that when I advocate for plate theory, I am saying, um, yeah, go out and bang as many girls as you possibly can. And I, I, I get why that they think that, and we'll talk about men's innate mating strategy here in a second. But the reason why they attack me through that way is because they think that uh, the goal is to increase your notch count. Like, listen to me with this right now. I've written five different essays on this. All of them are in book are in book one, and all of them are linked in the uh, in the description here. You can, if you don't want to buy the book, go and just read them on the on the website for free. That's fine. Um, but I've written several. This is this is old school stuff. This is like I, I you know say that this is remedial, but this is uh, this is an old school understanding of how to date non exclusively, because there's so much that gets tied up in this. Guys, like when I say, uh, you know, go out and and at least cultivate, curate uh, a roster of girls, right? Even two would be more than what most guys do. 
Uh, if you had three, if you had four, great. You don't have to be banging every single one. They have to be potential. They have to have some sort of romantic potential. That's what I'm saying. So uh, bear that in mind. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check out some of these here. What is the Fountain of Beta One-Itis movie? I don't even know what the fountain is. Are you talking about the fountain head? I don't know what that is. I haven't seen the fountain. What the hell is the fountain? Um, what else do I got in here? You guys have been on top of your game here today. Um, Psychedelic Sinai gave me a big fat euro. Thank you, man. Um, do you still do counseling? Yes, I do counseling. Um, I have sort of dialed it back a little bit uh, because of uh, me doing the book right now. But uh, I'm motionless, HD. If you want to book me for counseling or something like that, just uh, email me. It's rtrationalmail at gmail.com. And one man's way says, do you have a set of rules for us beta guys trying to spin plates similar to your iron rules? I have been burned and still have blue pill fallbacks. It seems I fall back mostly online because it's so easy. Yeah, I, I've said this before. I'm not a uh, I'm not a big fan of online uh, online dating. I'm not a big fan of. Uh, well, I got really solid text game. I know if you guys have seen the back and forth between me and john from modern life dating john thinks that that text game is is great and on point and you can you can really make that work for you uh and probably now since everybody is like socially isolating themselves maybe that's all you have left so uh, i'm not going to say that you shouldn't do that my concern is this and it's always been this and if you've read book one you'll know where i'm going with this is that i've always seen texting i've always seen online anything where you are not face to face with that with that person with that woman that is a buffer of some sorts i'm not it's only a buffer though if you are relying on it exclusively if that's it, it most guys when i talk about a buffer a buffer is anything that comes between you and any kind of like real human contact and we like even back as far as my so suave days we saw um we saw this happening a lot of guys would say, "Well, you know, I'm texting or this," and I'm or they'll uh, <laughs> they'll screen capture the um, they'll screen capture the the text exchange. Was this beta? And they'll like they'll highlight it, you know, with like a little script thing. Was this beta? What about this? What do I do? And I'm looking at this and I'm going, "Well, first of all, if this is all you're doing, if this is the only communication, if this is only a back and forth right here, you already have this as a buffer." And most guys use uh, then I shouldn't. I'm not going to harp on just like text game and stuff because there's other kinds of buffers, but, but certainly uh, an over reliance, let's just say on texting on, uh, you know, match.com on, you know, sugaring or whatever the hell it is. An over reliance on that is a buffer. It's a buffer against rejection. Um, so ask yourself before you hit me up and say, well, uh, how do I do this? What are, you know, is, what are the, what are the rules here for beta guys? Um, Again, this is sort of personal to you. I don't know what you're, how you're doing things. So I would have to know like specifics before I could really give you. That's why I don't do like 12, 12 rules for betas trying to spin plates. Um, there are some. I mean, I can give you a few basics and I will today. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that today. But I think that the, the primary point that I'm trying to get across with this particular cast is um, Understanding why it's necessary in the first place, why you should cultivate some kind of idea or some sort of non-exclusive plan for yourself. Because as I was saying before, when guys are 18 and they're idealistic and they're young, they'll make some very stupid decisions. And I know you probably, maybe some people in the chat today, uh, you probably know of a guy who, um, who made a bad decision when he was 19, right? He got married when he was 19. Uh, he, he, you know, maybe he knocked up a girl at 19 and now that guy's 30 years old. Now that guy's 40 years old. Those decisions, and they are commitments, um, made when you are younger and, uh, less educated. Uh, you don't have the same experience with women. You don't have the same experience with life. Um, you make those decisions early on and they have lifelong ramifications for you. And, you know, we're going to have teenage pregnancies. It's just simply something that's going to happen. You say, well, you should just abstain. Okay, well, fine. But the thing is, we're human beings and that, that those kind of things are going to happen. But the, the point is this, is that when we're younger as men, when we're younger and we're more idealistic, this is what happens. We do make commitments. We don't consider them commitments. We don't go, well, do I really want to commit to having a baby with this girl? No, you're banging her and you're going, and suddenly she's pregnant. Right. Or is this, you know, like guys don't have the experience enough with women at each shit even like 
25 years old. They don't have enough experience with women to understand what it is that they need in their lives in the long term. And that comes with experience, unfortunately. You, I mean, what is, uh, ex experience teaches harsh, but it teaches best. So one of the things that guys always criticize me about is say, well, role is all theory. Well, let me change that right now. You know what you need to do? You need to get out there. You need to go and you need to put this into practice. That's why I keep saying game is the practice. Red pill is the theory. And one informs the other and one is incomplete without the other. So get out there, go and do that. Right, go out, meet women face to face. You know, start. You know, don't over rely on buffers. There's, there's another. There's some. Here's some more advice for you. <laughs> you know, don't over rely on buffers. Meet, meet women face to face. Learn how. Learn social cues. Learn. You know, develop your social intelligence. Develop your social networks. And I don't mean like Facebook. I mean like your real social networks. Develop tribes. Develop uh, relationships that don't have to be sexual. They just, you know, you're learning things. So that would certainly be on point. Um, Yolo says, hi, Rolo. Thanks for explaining the differences between men and women, but in which areas are we alike? Uh, any essays about that? Yes, I do, actually, uh, Yolo. If you go and you look at, um, uh, it? in book two, I have a chapter called Complementarity, and that's also an essay I wrote on the Rational Mail, I think, back in 2014, 2016, somewhere around there. Complementarity is a good one. I've, I just go, I would say this, go and go on my blog and in the search engine, put in compliment or complementarity. And, and that's compliment with an E, not an I. So look that up and you'll see what, what I've said about that. Um, what else do we have here? Muhammad, uh, Matt Cross stole all of your ideas and said yesterday on IG, you don't live what you teach because you're married and not spinning plates. He is weird. Yes, he is weird. And I'll tell you another thing is if you really want to go and look up who, who Matt Cross is, go look at his tags on his videos and you will see exactly what he's doing. Um, you will see exactly who he's trying to appeal to. You'll see exactly whose audience he's trying to poach. Um, and, you know, as far as here's the thing is I've never claimed to be a pickup artist I'm, and I won't today, right? I have had a unique experience in my life and I can talk to, I talk about a great many things. Um, apparently he would rather dig into my, my books and dig into my work and try to stay as timely as he can because that's his bread and butter. These guys are grifters. Simple as that. He doesn't have anything like the, uh, the background that I have yet. doesn't have anything like the uh, body of work that I have. So there you go. Uh, what else do we have today? We're going to, we're, we're going to continue here in just a second. I want to just want to catch up with these. Have you read the anatomy of female power? Yes, I have actually. Um, good book too. Um, let's see. And yes, I have read Esther Perel and I have read the, um, uh, what is it? The manipulated man. I, I forget the name of the author, authoress of that, but yes, I have read those too. Uh, married at 20, got burned at 22. Now I'm here. Yep. There you go. Um, now you're looking, that's a, that's a good, <laughs> I hate to use that as confirmation, dude, because it probably sucks for you, but um, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, an idealism. Um, let's see what is Doman Lowe says, uh, plate spinning induces passive dread. It does. Now, well, it will teach you how passive dread works. Let's just say you don't necessarily have to uh, be, uh, <laughs> But we'll get into that. I'll, 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 I'm, I am going to touch on dread. He says, uh, keeps competition anxiety alive. Yes. Generates arousal. You are more outcome independent and have an uncrackable frame. Frame is everything. Yes, it is. Uh, let's see. Okay. So I think I caught up. Uh, if I missed anything, um, I don't think I missed anything. Um, let's see. I think I caught up. All right. Well, we'll continue here. Um Esther Villar, that's right. You are correct. Esther Villar is the manipulated man. She wrote that back in the 70s, too. So we're, we're moving on here. Why is it important to be to date non-exclusively? Well, first and foremost is to uh, gain experience, is to, and within reason, okay? I'm not saying go out there and willy-nilly just try to get as many chicks as you possibly can. In fact, I would suggest, I would, I, I've, I've done this before. I would say, Ed, I would advise against having, um, I don't say more than like four or five con, you know, contiguous, I guess, uh, plates. I would not want to have more than that. Cause a lot, here's the first thing I, I I'll give you, um, a few of the criticisms that I get when I talk about how it's necessary for men to date non-exclusively. 
Uh, the first one is this, is that um, I, I'm just not like that. Well, when I hear that from guys, like if I go in, they, when, when guys read my five part, six, six part series on, um, on plate theory, they, the first thing out of their mouths is, well, I could never do that. And the th first thing out of my mouth is, why do you think that way? Why is that some, why is that something that seems like unnatural for you? Why would that not even be a thought to you? And I'll, I'll, I asked this because I, th I would have said the same thing. When I was in my youth, when I was like 17, 18, 19 years old, I would have said exactly that same thing. I could never be a two time a two timer. I would never be a, you know, I could never be a playa. I I, you know, because there's this little thing in the back of your head that says, well, if I prove that I'm loyal, faithful, dependable, and uh, you know, I'm one man, one woman, I'm a good monogamous choice, then a woman will love me. There's a thing in most guys' heads, and this is a result, again, of that training, that conditioning from the time you're young by the village that is teaching you social enforced monogamy to embed it and hammer it into your head that you should be monogamous and that women appreciate that and women will always want that. And it's not that women don't want that, but they need you as a beta to believe that. They or even as an alpha, they need you to to believe that too. Because if men can be taught socially enforced monogamy, then what that does is it frees up women to pursue hypergamy. It it, it frees them up to date non-exclusively, to uh and, and when when we talk about women who have like multiple boyfriends particularly now it's really easy now that because we have like instagram we can see this in real time we used to not be able to see this like prior to us having social media to having like facebook and instagram and snapchat and all that stuff we we today it's it's just second nature to us particularly in the red pill communities to think of women as having orbiters to think of women as having like that um that need for attention served to them 24 7. Like you don't, you're like most uh, MGTOWs will like really kind of, for lack of a better term, destitute MGTOWs will say, uh, you know, why, what, why would I even bother with women? Because uh, I'm never going to be as good as the guys that she has access to 24 seven. There was actually a time when women didn't have that. Okay. There, that the need, the want for that attention was always there, but the access was not, it was limited. And so now they can go put a, a web a webcam up and um and have it anytime they want to. In fact, they can make a good living off of off of their uh their attention needs. So what guys do is they say, well, uh, you know, I I can't compete with that. I can't compete with the 24/7 access that that women have. Um I'm just going to give up. Uh and you know, more power to you, whatever. But the 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 point is this is that there was a time where that wasn't the case certainly in in my growing up anyways there was a time when you didn't have that that wasn't around but like there were still women you know you'd see a chick like guys would say well she's out of my league because she's so beautiful and look at the every guy in this every guy in this club wants to wants a banger yeah but that's the that's the thing is that women cultivate that that is women like if you say well women's got she's got a lot of uh, boyfriends or she's got a lot of male suitors we used to call it you know back in the victorian era it was oh you have a lot of male callers you know you have a lot of suitors and that was cool like if you go and you look at read it uh emily bronte or you leave uh what um jane Eyre, jane Eyre, i think if you read any of those old kind of like yeah you know, the stuff you had to read in like women's studies or your english you, know, you had to read the the women authors of the victorian era um, there was always that uh, what, pride and prejudice, right? Or um, it was being prudent to have many male callers. In fact, most of those stories are based on <laughs> on women dating not exclusively. Imagine that, right? I have um, in uh, in Plate Theory uh, section five, um, the, the the fifth essay. It's called Women's Game, and I will tell you this: right? I wanted to cover this. So I'm going to cover it now. Uh, women are natural plate spinners. They are n innately plate spinners they are not innately monogamous I and mean, i don't think i don't think human beings are innately monogamous i think we are we can force ourselves to be monogamous but i don't think we're innately not monogamous it's good for our species that we get together and we and of course we, we uh, develop and we nurture our children and of course there's a necessity for it but there's also a, a side of us that wants to well, certainly for men wants to spread the seed and for women it's about quality 
I didn't get a good quality guy. I'm going to divorce him. I'm going to go get a better quality guy. Okay. And that's the fundamentally, that's what hyper, God damn it. I, I said, I wasn't going to talk about hypergamy today. Fundamentally, that's what that is. But hypergamy is really based on women having choices. And so, but we don't call it like if a man has like four or five girlfriends in his roster, or he's spinning four or five plates. We say, Oh, that guy's a player, man. He's not, he's not somebody for you. Right. Well, I, I wouldn't do something like that. And here's here's the 16, 17, 18, 19 year old Rolo. I would never do something like that. I'm I'm unlike other guys. Other guys would go out and have many girlfriends, but not me, baby. I'm unique amongst all these guys, and I would never two time you girl. You know, well, shit, we write songs about that. I mean, like half of the 80s ballads are written about that. Well, I don't care if you got with those other guys. I don't care about all those men. Guy, listen to any REO speed. <laughs> listen to any REO speedwagon or any like journey or any like these old eighties like ballad power ballads. You'll get you'll understand, you know, how, what that what that uh beta game is. I wouldn't be like those other guys. Those other guys will play you. I wouldn't do that. I will be the best boyfriend. This this guy's it's being Mr. Perfect. And I've talked about this before, as perfect is boring. Uh perfect is you know, you're you're reliable, dependable. I was um I was reading a, a a tweet not too long ago about um, particularly in the situation that we're in right now with uh, with the the virus and all this stuff. And I'm going to tie this in, right? But particularly now that we have moved into sort of virus society, or where we'll certainly get to post virus society, and what is that going to do to our our social structure? What is that going to do to our um, our, our sexual marketplace? Well, what I think is funny right now is you'll see women that are kind of moving away from uh, open hypergamy now. It's not like they, they would rather you didn't think that they were like that. They did, would rather you didn't think that they, they were players. We don't call a woman with a lot of orbiters. We don't call her a player. We call her being prudent because, she, because we believe on some level of consciousness that women are the ones who should have the more selection and the guys are the ones that have to display. It's that dancing monkey theory, right? That men have to be the ones to perform, and they do. Oh, men have a burden of performance. Okay, that's fine. But the thing is, is what we like to think, what we would popular consciousness would have us believe is that women, they all know what's best for them and they need to make the choices for themselves and they are always going to pick the right guy. And, and th that's the concept. I mean, in practice, that doesn't happen. And we know that that doesn't happen. But in concept, that's what we're expected to believe. That a woman has, it's, what is it? A woman's prerogative, right? She can always change her mind. Why? Because she should have multiple guys and she should select amongst the, the best guys that she can attract. That's the concept. That's the, um, what, what the blue pill teaches men, boys and men. And it also teaches women because what it is, it's sort of like, well, we're going to keep these guys in the dark about all this stuff. We're going to, you know, they're going to be our mushrooms, right? We're going to keep them in the dark and shovel them shit. But you girl, you get to choose from all these guys because they all believe the same thing and they're all trying to give you the same thing. And they're, you know, most women don't want to have anything to do with a beta beta blue pill guy until they get to be in their epiphany phase until they, until they really need it. And that's where I was going with this is that the virus is really kind of pushing women into, I need dependability. I need a guy who is, I need that beta guy. Now I need the, uh, the, the Sheryl Sandberg says that there will be an equal partner waiting for me who believes that, the, that women should be outspoken and over time, nothing sexier. Where was my nothing sexier? I need him now, you know, rather than fomenting this idea that women should have like four or five guys that have all these or orbiters and they should be able to pick amongst the best one. Now that runs out obviously, because after a woman gets, you know, <laughs> she becomes a single mother, she becomes uh, less attractive. She becomes bitchy and feminist and cuts her hair and changes it all wild colors, whatever. When she stops caring, then men stop caring. Or when she doesn't, measure up to the other girls that are in competition with her. Like I said, a thing that I think guys need to understand is when I'm talking about plate theory and spending other plates or dating non-exclusively, understand that women are also in competition amongst themselves for the top ranking guys. And so that I think uh, guys tend to make women this sort of enigma. They think that they're these all like when we talk about pedestalizing women, I'm not saying that guys are pedestal. Like I think most, you know, red pill guys, red pill wear guys, they understand that they shouldn't pedestalize. But I think that there's a certain branch of the red pill tree where guys will say, well, um, 
she has all she can go down to the bar anytime she wants to and she can go and get laid when on a moment's notice if that's what she wanted to do and more or less that's true but it's only true by order of degree so if she's overweight fat bitchy whatever you know karen <laughs> um she can she still get laid yeah probably but not as well as hot sexy 22 year old stacy you know so there's 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 a lot of variance i should say in all of this and i think it's it's not in men's best interest to shoot themselves in the foot over that or to think that they can't you know can't get with a certain caliber of women because remember that woman at 23 is not going to be the same woman at 33 so so there's some things to keep in mind uh todd what are you asking it seems that old school pickup artist concepts such as neg hits and backhead and compliments are as useful now as they've ever been absolutely uh with women's egos being completely out of whack what do you say absolutely i don't think like like people are going to give me shit today about like not talking about the virus and oh my gosh we should all freak out and everything I, like the the point is this is like the stuff that i talk about the stuff that i get into the stuff that like these are the basics um this is intersexual dynamics this stuff has happened in world war ii this stuff happened in Victorian eras. This stuff happened in ancient Rome because men were men and women were women. We had different contexts. We had different societal standards. We had different things, different ways of expressing this kind of stuff. Yeah, in, in times before the sexual revolution, sure, men had a, 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 a better go of it at least in, into some, in some ways. I mean, you go back to the Old Testament. You go to, uh, you know, like I said, World War I, World War II. Things were different, but what doesn't change is the sexual dynamics. The underlying dynamics do not change. How they're expressed does with the times, with the culture, with religion, with whatever. And that's like when, when guys hit me up and they were like, oh my God, I can't believe it. We're all going to die. It's, you know, the, the, it's the, it's the flu. We're all going to die. And I'm like, or they'll say, well, the, the economy is on a hellbound train and it's going to, yeah, the economy is going to suck for a while simple as that and you can blame that on whoever the hell you want to blame it on okay the thing is is this is that it, you know people are comparing this whole thing to like the the great depression like well yeah but we didn't have the internet in the great depression we didn't have the kind of economy we have then we have so many different variables and that's the same thing with the sexual marketplace like we're talking about the economy that's one marketplace we're talking about the sexual marketplace as well the fundaments are still there the underlying basis of all this still is there how it's expressed is something you need to be ready for. It's something that you need to understand. That's why I'm doing this shit right now, okay? You need to understand these basics. So when you get to that point, so when all this shakes out, right, you're gonna be better off for having listened to this. You're gonna be, and, and maybe getting away from, from, you know, unplugging yourself from Twitter and under, you know, getting some information. Like, here's school's in session, gentlemen. I'm, I'm your professor. Um, so that's primarily one of the reasons I'm doing this, but. So anyways, um, moving on. So uh, just to answer Todd's question here real quick. Um, yeah, neg, neg hits, uh, backhanded compliments. Uh, remember what those are expected to do. And this gets me back on point. A neg hit, a backhanded compliment um, are, are meant to shake up the natural order of things. And it's, it's a flipping of the script is what it is. And, and PUA has picked up on this a very long time ago. Um, so when, a, when women are used to a certain degree of attention, when they're used to a certain, like they go on and they put a, a post up on Instagram and you've got 10 guys going, you're so hot, girl. If you got 10 guys, 100 guys doing that, and you got the one guy that goes, eh, yeah, you're right. That guy, that's the, that's the purple cow. Well, that's the concept anyways, right? That's the guy who's, who she has to qualify to. And that's women love to be able to qualify they want to because are they to a worthy guy let's not say they're not going to qualify to a guy that they don't have any interest in in fact, in fact they're going to hate you that much more they'll call hr on you <laughs> but if it's a guy that she has some sort of interest in and you are the purple cow if she has to qualify to you that was a primary you know technique that's why we got neg hits that's where we got that from is because it flips a script in case you guys were wondering, like, what, what is this? How does, how come this works? Or like a uh, cocky funny or peacocking or amused mastery, those kinds of things. Or uh, agree and amplify. That's another good one. Why do those work? Because it flips a script. 
because it's not men constantly going, please, please, can I have your pussy? Can I please? Can I please? That's, um, I mean, in essence, that's, again, this dancing monkey, but um, in essence, that's what women are used to. They're used to guys sucking up. They're used to guys giving easy compliments. And again, let's talk about uh, 48 Laws of Power again. Um, compliments that are too easily given are, are worthless. There's, there's a degree, there's a kind of attention that women like. There's, it's usually, you know, ones where that it's it, the kind of attention that has the, the, the prospect or the potential of becoming a good hypergamous match, right? Having a, getting with that guy, yeah, a compliment for, I mean, the, and, and what's funny is I keep seeing this in the post virus world where women were saying that, well, if a guy is ugly and he gives me a compliment, then it's sexual harassment. But if he's cute, then I want to go home with him or it's a good Tinder match. And you're going to see that. You, I think what's funny is there's a, there's going to be a, a point, I think in all of this, once, once this post virus world sort of shakes itself out, um, you're going to see women who, would rather go back to a concealed hypergamy as opposed to an open hypergamy because it's in their better it's in their best interest that guys don't know that and they're going to get really mad at guys like me they're going to get really mad at the the red pill sphere whatever you want to call that whoever you follow i don't care they're going to get really mad at us at me and those guys because we're giving up the game we're showing we've been doing this for a long time we're showing you guys like what you know what the reality of the sexual marketplace is and who you are who she is and how how all this works women would particularly in the post virus world they're going to be very uh they, they're going to want you to shut up they're going to want you to, they're going to want to go back to concealed hypergamy at least in the short term at least in the short term you're going to see that um let me move on a little bit further here and i'm trying to get to you guys uh, super chats during john garcia thank you for that big five bucks brother um let's see i will um i will i'm going to reserve um the last 30 minutes for discussion i think i might go two hours today i don't know we'll see i'm not going more than two hours you guys have our the, the votes are in and you don't want me to go that long so then that's fine so hopefully you guys are learning something from today uh drape toman i i'm sorry i didn't i i blew past your thing he says uh mental point of origin hold frame outcome independence a uh, few of the main keys for survival. Yeah, definitely. I think what is going to be really interesting in a post-virus world is the guys who um, who are going to be eager to believe the old blue pill conditioning and the guys who are going to say, well, look, finally, women have finally come around. No, they haven't. Their, their interests, I, I got into a big you know, Twitter debate about this just recently. It's like, Women will spin on a dime, man. Women will, because it's in their best interest, There's for, particularly from a survival standpoint. If you, you guys have ever, I really should do this. I, I need to do a a, a, a live cast or a, a, a podcast of some sorts about um, war brides. Uh, I've, I've talked about alpha widows before, but I really want to talk about war brides. The war bride dynamic is going to be something that, um, maybe I'll do that Wednesday. Uh, war brides are going to be, Guys are going to need to understand what War Brides is really all about, particularly in what I think is coming up uh, with respect to the sexual marketplace. Um, Negs are you, uh, Graham Miller says, uh, Negs are useful anywhere in the world to shake up sexual dynamic, but in SMPs uh, where men have the upper hand, a uh, general, a gentler neg may be all you need. Um, you know, uh, let me tell you something about there, there are certain. Um, there's certain topics or certain there's certain techniques, let's say, uh, pickup artistry techniques that guys had a real tough time with, particularly every, you know, from from the very beginning, from from 2002, um, I've had these conversations where guys will say, "Well, I could never do that," or "I could never," I why would you do a neg hit? She won't like you. You're supposed to make her like her. You're supposed to, you know, take her to the dance. You're supposed to, you know, buy her chocolates. You're supposed to give her a nice card and sprinkle the bed with rose petals. That's that's old school. That's old order thinking right there. And so when I say you should spin plates, 
or as Graham is saying here, you should use neg hits, uh, you know, spraying or use dread. I've always said, you know, overt dread is, I mean, you can go back and look at the, the, the video I did on it, but overt dread is something you want to avoid using, but passive dread is something you should encourage. It's something you should always, you should roll with and go with and, and use it as a form of uh, social proof of pre-selection and go with it and be brave enough to experiment with that. Most guys, and this gets me back on point. Most guys are too scared to spin plates. They are scared shitless. And the reason that they're scared is the next topic on my list here, which is scarcity mentality. And one thing that the blue pill teaches guys is scarcity to think that there's only one when I talk, and I'm going to get into this very soon, I might do a standalone video. I'm not sure I'm going to do it on a stream, but I'm going to do a standalone video on the soulmate myth. And there's a reason why the soulmate myth is so pervasive, particularly in our society right now. Because what it does is it encourages the idea, and particularly in men, um, that they there should only ever be one person for them. They need to find the one. I hear that more from men than I do from women. I hear more guys, and, and this is just me sort of monitoring conversations and watching, you know, like when I'm at a, a promo or something like that or where wherever I'm at, I hear more guys say they'll make a reference to the one. I think she might be the one. I've heard Matt Hussey say, oh, well, you got to find your one. In fact, they uh, that's a, a selling point for a lot of Purple Pill coaches. I'll help you find your one. eHarmony will help you find your soulmate. Because they know that that's an insecurity. That's an insecurity that is inculcated, like there's your $10 word today, is embedded, inculcated in your psyche from a very early age. That's what Disney does. Oh, you're my, you're my betrothed. You're my intended. You're the one that God intended for me. You must be my soulmate, right? Where there's only one perfect soulmate and now we're together. And finally, we can live happily ever after. And if you can't find that, well, don't worry about it. I've got this great course over here that'll help you find your soulmate. How awesome would that be? You know, it's a it's a it's a basic principle. The basic principle is this: is to um, uh, to promote fear and then to sell security, and that goes for a lot of different things. It's not just like in relationships and stuff like that, but it certainly is something like in within you know the sexual marketplace today, popularized, westernized sexual marketplace today. So bear in mind, usually uh, if somebody is playing on something like the soulmate myth um, or the myth of the quality woman, um, usually it's because they, the, the person selling you on that idea already knows that that's an insecurity in you. And it's, it's, it's basic marketeering, profiteering, right? Create the problem and then sell the solution to the problem. Something to keep in mind, particularly in the coming I'm using that word a lot today. Why I keep saying particular? <laughs> Excuse me. You know, I <laughs> if you see me like wiping my lips, it's because this is I have um, bulletproof coffee and it's got that butter in it that you have to for the MCT oil, and so it's like you get this like film. <laughs> and, I mean, it's good stuff. I like it, but man, it's like it's not something you want to read on a or drink on a podcast. Um, let me see, you know, every once in a while, there's a really good post in here or a really good comment. Um, yellow again, thank you for that 55 Norwegian cuckoo berries. Uh, what is the survival reason that women need attention and why does she need attention from orbiters? What happens if her to her, if she don't get that attention? Um, well, remember attention is the coin of the realm in girl world. So the capacity to generate attention and particularly valuable attention. So there is a, a, a generating attention is one thing and women are happy to have it, but there's like sort of different grades, I think of attention. And of course the, you can get it. Women are happy to have attention from like from each other. I think that's pretty obvious. Right? You, you gotta walk into a, a crowded room in a party or something like that. You're in and a hot chick walks into the party. And what's the first thing a group of women do? What is she? Like, who would wear that? You know, oh, she kind of looks like a slut. You know, like with that first thing out of their mouth, they get start. They start talking about. It. Of course, they they try to tear her down and and everything until they get to know her. And they go, "Oh, girl, I love you." You know, but at first, there's that 
you know, back because she's generating more attention than they are, or they're trying to find out how much attention she can generate, whether it's from other men or it's from them, whatever, obviously they're giving them attention, but the most valuable attention that women can get is from a high value man. And that learning that lesson as a guy, you need to learn that right now, because if you are a high value guy, your attention is going to be something that is a commodity to that girl. And most guys give it away too easy. And that's, uh, God, that, I'm, I'm getting off topic, but uh, we, we'll do it. Uh, go and check out, I uh, have a, um, God, what's the post? The post is uh, Your Attention, Please. It's an old post. I think it's in the first book too. Go read that and you'll understand the principle of attention. Um, what else is in here? I'm not five foot one, dude. I'm five foot 11. <laughs> Five foot one. No, 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 no. Let's see what else we got in here today. Okay, I think I'm caught up. Did I catch up? I think I caught up. Pat draped him in. Love is blind. Oh, you guys really want me to do a love is blind breakdown, don't you? Should I do that? Should I do a, a love is blind breakdown? Uh, let's see. Okay, so I caught up with Todd. Okay, so let's moving right along. So I wanted to also I I'm got my list here of, of my my bullet points that I need to get to. Um, the the first thing that well the first thing guys say is they say well I could never do that. And the reason why you have a problem with non exclusivity is because usually it's fear. It's fear that if I screw this up, it might be my only chance for my soulmate. And or I, you don't even necessarily have to believe in soulmates. It's guys, I think, on some level of consciousness, particularly beta guys, realize that their access to women is not as good as, say, like their their buddy who's the natural with girls, right? The guy who's who's getting laid all the time. The guy who's the stereotypical player. Um, a player is a guy who can facilitate his innate mating strategy, whether he's doing it like intentionally or he's doing it unintentionally. The guy that we think of as the stereotypical player is the guy who can have access, unlimited access, I'm theoretically, unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. That is what men's innate mating strategy is because we have a biology that is intended to spread the seed, uh, ejaculate and evacuate. That's one of the reasons why we, when we see a good, good looking girl, it triggers a part in our brain that's associated with tool use. We tend to see women, we do. We objectify ladies we objectify you sexually that's the natural way of us saying we have to insert reason between us seeing you and wanting to bang you and going okay i shouldn't objectify her you know we, we've got to find some way to sort of make pretend like we're mature right but our our natural untrained organic way of viewing women is we see a half naked woman we go okay she's acceptable for reproduction that's it oh, do, boobs ass legs good to go and it happens it happens in less time than it took me to say that sentence <laughs> so so there's the natural side of seeing a woman and 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 uh and triggering our 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 what is it, the, the part of our brain with tool use because we want to solve the reproductive problem how do we do that well she's seeing her as a tool see her as object as objects is she good yeah okay well then maybe we'll get to know her um so that's that's the innate side of you know for us to for men and for women to to be monogamous is something that we have to make a conscious effort for and when guys tell me or they debate with me saying well we're naturally monogamous um no in fact monogamy is a is a rarity in the animal kingdom well we're not animals uh, well okay I'll, I'll even i'll even give you that maybe we're not animals but we have to make a conscious effort to be monogamous if we were naturally monogamous, we would not have to make a conscious effort to be monogamous. So there's a difference in, in terms of monogamy as well. Like if you go and you look at like the, um, I'm going to get into polyandry, uh, polyamory here in just a second, but well, I'll just do it right now. Uh, so when guys hit me up and they say, well, what, you know, you're seems like you're really against uh, polyamory. I'm not, necessarily against polyamory i'm just pointing out what's happening i'm observing that think of me as like diane fossey in gorillas in the mist think of me as jane goodall think of me as the an observer 
watching this go on and giving you my objective i you know the dots that i'm connecting i'm not saying like people want to say like, i i come out pretty hard against abortion it's not from a moralistic principle that i'm against abortion i'm against it just in in the practical aspect of it you can make a, a case for morality all you want i've always said that hyper or uh, was it um uh, abortion is the ultimate expression of hypergamy if I go and I say, well, why is it that women will fight tooth and nail to keep abortion safe and legal? Well, because it's a fail safe. It's a fail safe for a bad hypergamous decision. So I had sex with this guy. I got knocked up. I don't want to have his baby. Well, good. We live in a country where I can just simply go and have it vacuumed out. All right, cool. That's not me being, oh, wait, I do here's in the Bible. It's a, I'm not saying anything like that. I'm saying that the reason, the, the, the practical underlying, you look under the hood, this is why. This is why this is happening. That's why I'm against abortion. It's not because of, you know, like, sure, I can say that there's a moral issue to it as well. I could make that, I could make that case as well, but I'm not going to do that because I'm looking at this from an objective perspective. That's what I'm talking about. So when I talk about like women's uh, need for attention, when I talk about women's, uh, why does, competition anxiety work. why does any of this kind of stuff work well primarily because i'm looking under the hood i'm looking at it from a practical application so something to consider uh so anyways um when guys tell me that they could they would never feel like they could do that the reason is is because for a very long time from the time they're you know, like i said five years old they've been trained to believe that monogamy is the only acceptable context with in which to have sex or and because and they believe this because they think women also share this which they don't not na not naturally anyways uh, that has to be learned again monogamy has to be a conscious effort and when you teach a little boy from five years old till he's 25 years old that that's the only acceptable context and we do this of course in religious circles as well but the only acceptable context is either monogamy or in marriage and when you when that's the case you're going to make some really bad i more often than not you're going to make some really bad ideological and idealistic decisions according to that because your what your your natural impulse is to want to get to sex and so if if premarital sex or only monogamous sex i mean you're not saying premarital you can still have sex but you're in a monogamous relationship a lot of guys think that that's the only way that they can do that and the reason is is because they know that they cannot facilitate their innate mating strategy which is unlimited access to unlimited sexuality i always use that whenever i mention that i say this if you don't believe me about men's innate mating strategy all you have to do is go, go look at pornhub stats today in the post virus world go look at at the at the sharp sharp increase in uh let's say viewing time on pornhub and you will understand exactly what i'm talking about that is men's primary reproductive goal is is unlimited access to unlimited sexuality uh, you know, uh, I think uh, it's no secret. And this here's this is Dr. Phil Oprah. Like, like guys, like guys love variety. Yeah, but well, okay, that well, you know, there's just guys. That's just how they are. Well, why, you dumbass? Why, why are you not asking the question? Why that's the case? Well, it's because it's our biology. It's the way that we're built. It's the way we evolved. It's the way that you know, in one ejaculation, I can potentially inseminate thousands, if not millions, of women. But doesn't happen of course but that's men's mechanics that's the mechanics of it so what happens is we have a social order we have something that teaches us that we have to be monogamous we have to stay with one person and we teach men that if they do that then they're unique because everybody else is just having sex willy-nilly and if you go and you say you want to be the perfect boyfriend or the perfect husband and perfect father then women will select you and guys get that and they go okay well i better identify with women i better be more like i better do what they want me to do that's just male deductive logic it's like well um i want to get laid and i got to ask women how do i get laid okay i do oh you're gonna be this and you're gonna be sweet and you gotta have be funny and you gotta love your mom and you gotta like puppy dogs and you gotta like disney and rainbows and okay okay what else do i have to do okay and then they'll do that and they'll cater their lives so that they can do that and the primary thing is that they've got to be loyal dependable blah, blah 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 and as i was saying before before i got interrupted here um i was participating in a, a twitter thread not too long ago about um 
how <laughs> literally this woman said, uh, I had to break up with this boy or this guy. She it was a, uh, it was a text exchange where she's trying to explain to him why she broke up with the guy. And he, she said, she said, well, you're too perfect. You're too perfect for me. And the guy's like, that makes no sense at all. And it makes perfect sense to her because here you have like a 22, 23 year old woman and she's putting off this guy who is too perfect, who is quote unquote too perfect. And then in the next exchange, she says, well, um, you're the kind of guy that I, I want when I'm 28. I mean, literally saying, I want you when I'm in my epiphany phase, when I'm done on the, on the cock carousel, when I'm done with my party years, um, then I want you to wait for me. And I've written like two different essays about this, uh, the wait for me dynamic, the idea that women will meet the guy who's that idealist, perfect monogamous guy who's ready to idealistically marry her right then and there, as I was saying before, uh, at 18, 19, 20 years old. And women, I think, particularly high value women with high sexual market value, understand this. They know that that guy would be great in at a different time. He's, he's too early. He's Mr. Perfect and he's too early because she still wants to go and explore her options. That's the way they say it. They want to have many male suitors. They want to have more options. They want to experience more guys. They, they will, they'll, they'll, you, all kinds of euphemisms will come around out of it. Well, I got to find myself. I'm on my journey of self-discovery. I'm on, you know, they, of course, you know, in the red pill, I say, oh, yeah, she's just whoring around. Or it's her par I call, I'm, as nice as I can put it, I say she's in her party years. And she wants, because she knows what her agency is, and a very attractive woman is going to do that. She wants to parlay that, 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 powerful state that the most powerful position she's going to be in is 21 22 23 years old women know this they know that innately and you know what else they know innately they know that when they get to be 29 30 31 years old somewhere in there they're going to need a perfect guy like you but you're too perfect so i got to break up with you tell you what uh and this was a this was an episode of friends back in the 90s it, it was like ross and rachel right they're splitting up they're taking a break right and they made this deal. If we're both single when we're 30, then we'll get married. Like, what kind of shit is that, right? Like today, when you see that, when you see, when I, well, just me even saying that, I can't help but laugh because like with a red pill lens and you, you, you think about those terms, you see, you know, what's going on. We know what the plan is. We know what the, the mechanics are and the schedule is, but with like in the nineties, we didn't, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have 20 years of the red pill. We didn't have 20 years of, of the things that we understand right now. But we go back and we look at those episodes and we go, oh my God, how horrifying. Or we look at a look at a Mrs. Doubtfire. If you've ever watched that movie, if you haven't watched that movie and you're looking for a movie to, to sort of like really rattle your cage as a red pill aware guy, go watch Mrs. Doubtfire and understand that Robin Williams is dead by suicide, right? And then look at the look at the dynamics in that movie. Look at the sexual intersection, the gender politics in that movie. It is not a comedy. It is a horror movie. <laughs> but that's it. That's what I was just going to say is that. So you got these guys who are are hell bent to have a, a, a monogamous relationship because they believe that that's their key, and they also believe in a scarcity mentality. And that means that there's only one for them. So if guys who believe in a scarcity mentality, they believe in uh, serial monogamy, they believe in a soulmate, they believe in trying to find their one. I mean, it, sound like, it sounds like a chick, doesn't it? It sounds like a woman, like an earlier version of a woman, like maybe back in like the turn of the century, like back in, I say Victorian, but like just say the 1900s or whatever. That sounds like a chick who's, oh, I got to find the one for me. You know, it's something you would read in, in, in Jean, Jean Eyre or whatever, you know. Um, why is it that guys are doing that? You know, why, why is it that men are doing well? Because they've been conditioned to believe those things. They've been conditioned to think that that's like, well, I wrote this, uh, I wrote a poem. People will, anybody who's read my book or, or any of my work knows this. I wrote a very, I think, seminal post about uh, the myth of the lonely old man. And the reason I wrote that was because I was seeing what was being gender swapped. The myth of the lonely old man is actually the same myth that we used to sell. I don't know if you call it a myth, but we used to sell to women so that they wouldn't become spinsters, so they wouldn't become old maids. <laughs> Jerry Watch, um, uh, was it? Uh, it's a Wonderful Life. And then when they have the, the, the world 
turns upside down because George Bailey's gone. Now, Mary, the, the woman who was his wife and the mother of his kids, she's an old maid. Like that was the worst thing that could happen to a woman in 1940. All right, 1930, late 30s or mid 40s, somewhere around. That was the worst thing that could happen to a woman. Oh, I don't want to be an old maid. She even says that. That's a joke in the. That's a joke in the in the uh, script. I don't. Why did you marry me? Oh, I don't want to be an old maid. <laughs> well, thanks. But that was a fear. And then, then we teach that to guys now too. That so now guys fear being the lonely old man. And, and women use that against us. They use it against guys. They say, well, I can't believe anybody thinks anything the, 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 the way that you do. You're going to be lonely and die without any kids and any friends. Like that's, a, that's what pretty much the spinster you know, fear was too. So they sell that to guys now. Why is that effective against guys? Because they've been conditioned to think the soulmate myth and, and you know, serial monogamy. And they've been conditioned for a scarcity mentality not an abundance mentality. And that's really, I think that is one of the hardest aspects of guys to accept when they get unplugged because they've never had that before. They've never had a woman actually be genuinely interested in them beyond like, say, if they had money or the status or whatever, you know, beyond that, having, I, I, I talk about like, um, I, I written a post called uh, transactional sex versus validational sex. They've never had validational sex. It's never been this, this thing where she really has this raw animal monkey sex, you know, desire to just tear his clothes off and, and bang him. It's always been mitigated by something. Uh, I've said, again, another thing I've talked about is women make rules for betas and they break rules for alphas. In this case, I'm going to focus on the, on the beta side. When a woman is making those rules, that's all these guys have ever had an experience with. Well, that's just the, like, if you say, well, what, if you talk to a beta guy who has, who is a serial monogamist, he's like the worst, like beta doormat guy you've ever known. But if you talk to him, you say, well, what are women like? If he, he, he will give you a, an assessment of women, but it's all based on uh, trans on transactional sex. It's all based on what he can do. It's all based on him qualifying. It's all based on him being as nice as he can. It's all all based on being as dependable and as uh, as as following of the old social contract as he can possibly muster. That's what women want. You you could ask this guy, "What do women want?" He will tell you that right there. That that's the the epitome, I think, of blue pill thinking, is that. Uh, women, uh, they only want a transaction. They only want this. They only want that. I have to do that. Women want men to jump through hoops, right? Like guys will say this all the time. They'll say, well, you know, Rolo, he shouldn't be talking about pickup artistry. That's just dancing monkey. Something. You know what? That's blue pill thinking right there. It's blue pill thinking because you see that because women, most likely women have only ever given you tasks, tasks to complete rules to follow not rules to break rules to follow and you think okay like you'll get like people will ask me all the time they'll say well what about blue pill alphas yeah those blue pill alphas excel at passing those tests but they that's their idea that's what they think women want that's why when i say spin more plates oh i can't believe you'd say something like that no we wouldn't do no you wouldn't want to do that no woman would ever want to be with you and women will use that as well by the way if i go and i say Men need to spend more plates. You need to date not exclusively, yada, yada, yada. That's the first thing out of a woman's mouth. I would never go for a guy like that. No, you would. And you probably have. Again, medium is the message. Don't go by what they say. They will say that all day long. I would never go with the guy who's you know, had other girls. But here's the thing is that in practice, women would rather be with, a, or I'd rather bang and be with a, or share a successful alpha than they would to be saddled with a faithful beta. And we see this time and time and time again, thanks to our new broadened information society that we're in right now, right? Thanks to the new order. And that's gonna be a real important uh, distinction that we're gonna have to make here pretty soon, particularly in a post-virus world. In our new order, we have, if you're a red pill aware man, if you call yourself MGTOW, if you call yourself, I don't give a fuck what you call yourself, okay? You need to be aware. So there's going to be guys who are asleep. There's guys who are still plugged in and they're going to fight to stay plugged in. And there's going to be the guys who are already aware of this. How you use that awareness is up. You, know, you can do whatever you want to with that. I'm, you know, I'm not going to give you prescriptions, but there's going to be guys who are aware 
and they're stuck or they're in the new order, understanding all of this and from new information, uh, these, this, from conversations we've been having for almost 20 years now. And I've been there for all 20. Thank you. So you got those guys who are red pill. I keep using red pill wear and you're going to see the guys and those guys are in the new order. And you're going to see guys who are in the old order, the old way of thinking, the old social contract. And they will you be kicking and screaming. Will they be brought into the new order? And they will. And this, this whole, you know, virus thing that's going on right now, that's going to be the catalyst. That's what's going to drag them into this. And, you know, I, I know a lot of MGTOW guys right now um, and maybe MRAs too. Um, black pill guys think that this is their, their holy moment of truth. Like this is, here it is black and white. I can't believe bro is talking about anything else. Oh, no, I'm talking <laughs> now everything that I've said thus far about, um, about the spinning plates, about everything that I've talked about this. Now imagine this in a post virus world, imagine having that awareness and knowing that you know, women are okay with cognitive dissonance. I've said that before. Women have, especially if it has something to do with hypergamy, if it has something to do with their, uh, with the war brides dynamic, if it has something to do with their survival or the survival of their offspring, women have no problem whatsoever with cognitive dissonance. Great, you know that. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to? How are you going to use that for your betterment in the post-virus world? How are you going to use that? That's that's really up to you. Are you gonna are you gonna just hold up and not do anything with it, or are you going to use it? To, are you gonna leverage it to your advantage? That's what I'm saying. And maybe some guys won't. Maybe some they just simply don't want to do it. Um. So, but going forward here, I think that, um. First of all, it's it's important for you guys to abandon the idea of a scarcity mentality. You need to when when guys unplug, and I say like kill the beta. Kill your kill off your old self, kill off your old understanding, kill off that old order version of you. That's what I'm that's what I'm getting at. In in this new order, in your new understanding, in your red pill awareness, you need to know that you have options. You're gonna particularly right now, because women are already saying, Well, I need to find me a, a, a good man with some benefits because again, they don't care about this cognitive dissonance. They only go with what they need and they're they'll they'll pivot on a dime, man. And, they, and you will see this, you're seeing it now. And I think that in like the next two weeks, you're going to see it intensify. And so now suddenly these blue collar workers, suddenly these truck drivers, suddenly the guys who are working in the garbage, suddenly, suddenly these guys who are the most essential parts of human society, the essential parts. And that's, keep that in mind because I'm writing a post that's going to go up either tomorrow or Tuesday and it's going to be about uh, being essential and being non-essential. And I thought that was kind of an interesting term that I'm seeing floating around in the mainstream media right now, like essential personnel, essential men, essential this. Right? Now, I'm not saying that you know women aren't essential too. There are, I mean, particularly in medical fields. But um, let's let's be uh, you take, outside the medical field, and men are definitely you know needed in the medical field. Um, you know, what's an essential service? What's an essential utility, and what is not? And how and who's working those jobs? Mostly men, guys who have security, guys who still have a job right now. Um, you know, fortunately, I'm self-employed. Great, but you know, it doesn't mean I'm immune to any of this shit too. We keep talking about, oh, you got to be anti-fragile. Well, yeah, you're anti-fragile until the lights go off, pretty much. Um, so having you know, having this awareness, understanding, you know, what uh, you know, intersexual dynamics are all about. It, it's very important. To keep this in mind, to have this, to have this awareness, because it's not just about you um, getting laid. It's not just about you. Oh, I got to find me a wife, or oh, gee, suddenly all these women really want to get with me. It's not. It's not just about that. It's what happened before, and where we'll probably go back to once everything normalizes, once everything shakes down. I think it's very important right now for guys to look at what's going around with a very critical eye, particularly if you're, if you consider yourself red pill aware, you need to look at what's going on, not just in, uh, you know, death tolls and everything else. It's important for you to see the shift, see the shift in attitude. Like we were talking about this on rule zero, how like we don't see any 
women talking about, or we don't talk about uh, pronouns now, right? We don't care about LGBTQ stuff anymore. We're not talking about transgender kids anymore. Um, you know, we've shut down abortion clinics. And of course, you know, trad cons just, yay! okay, okay. But beyond that, you're not seeing much of a pushback on any of this because the, the, the world's changed We're overnight, literally within a week, week and a half now, overnight. But watch what happens when we go back to some kind of state of normalcy. And keep in mind this as an illustration of women's nature, of men's nature too. But in, in our topic, in our wheelhouse here, look at what women are doing. I, I was jokingly saying this uh, yesterday on, on Rule Zero. I said, you know, the epiphany phase has just been pushed back probably about four years. So if the epiphany phase is 29 to 31, like I usually tag it at, it's now 25 <laughs> or, you know, 25 to 27, like that three year period, because now guys who have their shit together, those guys that we're always were complaining, oh, they're extending their adolescence or these are the guys who are the, the hikokomoris, right? These are the guys who, who are the kid ults, all that stuff. They didn't have their shit together. Now the guys who did have their shit together, they suddenly are are the are the guys that we're looking to. They're the guys that uh, have that performance that we're looking for. And now, you know, you see women who were. I, I I think it's funny. I was looking at some of these um some of these articles here. Of course, there's one in the Atlantic saying uh, this is a this is the end of feminism, or it's the uh, it's an inconvenience to feminism. Yeah, you're damn right it is because feminism is only supportable on, you know, in certain economies. When economy flourishes, when a society flourishes, yeah, you're going to get that. When it's gone, nobody talks about that. And you know what? Women don't talk about that. Women don't care about that. At you know, they don't care about feminism or fem power. Like I would say fem empowerment when the lights don't come on. And that's something to remember in all of this when we go back. Hopefully, we go back. I think we. But we go back to whatever normalcy becomes, you will see just how quickly women go from being like, oh, I really need a man who's got some benefits to like, oh, I really want to fuck this guy over here. He's hot. Uh, yeah, he, I don't care if he's in prison. <laughs> you know, you're going to see, you'll see that. That's why I keep saying like, um, I, I should probably do a, a post on or an essay on this, but like the, uh, the medium is the message. Watch the medium now. Watch what's happening now. So keep that in mind. Uh, the other thing I I, I want to get to a couple other little posts right here, or little topics here. Um, I'm at one thirty seven right now. So, um, so my the other thing a lot of guys will say is um, I I couldn't be I couldn't do this on my own. The other one is a lot of guys will say, well, um, it's too much effort. It's too much problem. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to have five girlfriends. I don't want to have four girlfriends. Um, I can't spin that many plates. It's usually that's a it's a cope. It's a cop out. I get it. I I don't want to spin plates because um, I, they'll find out about each other. And if that is your concern, you're not spinning plates. You're not spinning plates right. And the reason for that is because you're still stuck in your old serial monogamous mindset that that's the way that you're supposed to do it. Remember, you're not. Again, yes, your mating strategy, your innate mating strategy is unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. You need to insert your will. You need to put yourself in between that. Put your reason and your rational mind between that and say, well, I'm going to be influenced by this. That doesn't mean I have to be a slave to it. I, do I have personal responsibility? Yes, you do have personal responsibility. Okay, it's, I, I'm not a... Um, I don't, I'm not saying you are... Was it? Uh, God damn it. I was just reading this. It was... Um, there's dualism and then there's sort of the ghost in the machine kind of thing. Like you're not just the machine, right? There's something else that's you can, you have free, you have some choice and things that you can do as a human being. I will say that outright. Is there an influence of your animal side that's going to, you know, promote you towards certain things? Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? You need to be aware of that and you need to be, uh, you know, assess those things. So when I say spin more plates, I'm not saying that to, to, tell you to go just, you know, indiscriminately have sex with women. I'm saying that you need to do that within a prescribed context, which is you're doing it not necessarily because you want to bang a lot of women. It, well, maybe that's the case, but not necessarily the case um, because you're, you're doing that because you want to stay non-exclusive. You want to get some experience with women. 
you know, it's not the, the, the point is not to increase your, your notch count. It's to get experience with women. It's to understand the nature of women. And if you have sex with them along the way, okay, that, that, if that's what you choose to do, I'm not going to tell you don't do or don't. I'm just saying that if you, if that's what you choose to do, do so responsibly. But when guys tell me like, well, I couldn't do that because, um, because the other girls will find out or it's too much, or too much work. When I say, when guys say, say it's too much work, it's usually because they don't understand. Well, first of all, they don't understand game. They also don't understand that when you're spinning plates, the plates just spin themselves. Women the, who are in your roster should be in your roster because they have a genuine desire to get with you. Whether they know, whether they don't know, I'm not saying go tell them all about the chicks that you're with. Maybe that's your game. Maybe that's what you want to do. I know that uh, Andrew Tate can do that because he's in a position where he can do that. Most guys aren't in a position where they can do that. So when, when Andrew Tate is saying, well, uh, you know, comply or goodbye, that's a good attitude to have. Sure. But most guys can't enforce that. They, they, they don't have a, or they think that they can't enforce that. It still needs to be your mode of thinking. It still needs to be how you're dealing with the women that are in your roster. Now, so there's there there's the idea that it's too much effort, it's too much work. I can't do it all the time. I can't keep these girls. I can't keep this all afloat all the time, and I and still focus on my mission and everything. If you if your spinning plates interferes with your passions, your ambitions, your desires, the things you know, the directions that you're going, then don't spin plates. If it interferes that much, if you say, well, I'm I'm getting my business together, I'm going to be this, I've got a passion to do this, I'm in school for this, I'm in my internship, I'm in my residency, I'm in whatever it is, and I got to focus on that. You know what? It's probably best that you don't have a girlfriend at all. But if that if if spinning plates gets in the way of you following your your desire, your your ambition, then yeah, don't spin plates. But most guys, that ain't most guys. Definitely not most guys. Most guys are not that driven. I hope you are, but most guys aren't. And I'm not saying that it, you even have to do this. Again, these are suggestions. I'm just saying that non-exclusivity is something that will um, will help you later on in life. Certainly to get experience with women, but it's also to to uh, it's also so you understand how competition anxiety works, how dread works. Um, and it, it's just really kind of better for you because now you're in a position where you can uh, select. Also, non-exclusive dating, is, I'm not going to say it's proof against it, but it is certainly uh, a way to be resistant to the idea of the soulmate. So if you believe in the one, if you believe in this social conditioning about monogamy as the only way, dating many women and understanding the nature of women by doing so this is a valuable lesson. So that's another reason is I'm not saying it's proof against it because a lot of guys will get, they'll, they'll get with the hot. I got it with the hot. I, I learned game. Bro, well, thanks. I got the hottest girl I've ever been with. See you later. And, and then they come back to me like eight months later and I go, I can't believe it. She left me. She was the hottest girl I ever had. Oh, what do I do? I lost the frame. How do I get her back? Because you didn't realize you didn't stop and say well maybe i shouldn't be doing maybe i should have more plates going at the same time maybe i shouldn't have overcommitted everything into one thing i'm not saying that commitment is necessarily a bad thing either i was saying that at the beginning of this like we were talking about what is commitment what's not well some commitment a commitment that you put yourself into and in, from an educated position is something i think that guys should do definitely but be educated and if you don't want to put yourself into that position of commitment, according to what you know about that commitment, don't do it. Your happiness, your survival, her happiness, her survival, your kids, any kids you have, all your families. The thing about it, it's a cascade effect. Like think of all the, the things that are attached to that decision. Make sure you make the best decision that you possibly can. Most guys will say, well, don't, don't get married at all. Okay, then don't. If that's if that's your educated decision, then don't then don't do it. If you say, "Hey, I want to get married. I got this girl. You know, we're on the same page. Uh, whatever. Um, I was spinning plates for you know four years. She was the best of the of the bunch. Uh, go for it. You know, do whatever you're gonna do. Um, but go in with eyes wide open. Not. Oh, I, didn't, didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't see her come. She turned into somebody else. I can't believe it. Can't believe I got raked over the coals in the divorce machine. 
Well, no, you knew going in. You knew the da- you knew the dangers. Um, so scarcity mentality, abundance mentality. You also develop uh, by doing so. You develop a sense of confidence. Now, why is it different than poly? This is my understanding. Of it, okay, I'm not gonna. Yeah, you. I'm sure somebody's gonna come up and say, "Oh, it's not the way I define poly." Okay, fine, whatever. It's subjective. Okay, whatever you whatever you want to call poly. I call poly a guy or girl, whatever, in a relationship where they open up that relationship to fucking other guys or other girls, whatever. You know, however you choose to to do that. Um, I think what's interesting right now in the post virus world, I see a lot of polygamists or, or polyamorists, I guess. Uh, suddenly now they want to be, oh, and now there's no, now there's two genders and we're all monogamous, you know, in this time of crisis, let's all go back to the conventional way of doing things because that was the most stable and most, that's where we look for our security is in those old, in that old order understanding in that old order way of thinking, I'm not saying that all old order way of thinking is bad. Keep that in mind. I, I think maybe people will misconstrue that. They'll say, well, Rolo thinks that all those, the the wisdom of the ancients is not a good idea. That's what Rolo said. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there's we have a better understanding of that wisdom, of that old order. Or we can just say, hey, it's, it's bullshit. Or we can say, hey, it's great. It's valuable. It's wisdom. Let's keep it. We can do that now because we have a better understanding of those things. But so you got um you got uh, polyamorists saying you know uh, that they want to get back into to being a, a monogamous relationship or they're looking for their security in conventionally monogamous relationships right now which should speak volume you want to talk about uh, uh, the medium is the message there's a really big medium right there um, and, and again it's not me gloating I I'm just saying I'm just ob- observing this stuff I'm not again I'm not anti poly i'm not anti-abortion i'm not anti this or whatever i'm just showing you what's god this is the observations these are the dots that i'm connecting you want to make a judgment call be my guest um but the the difference between poly and non-exclusive exclusive dating is there's no implication of exclusivity and that i think is where a lot of guys who start spinning plates really drop the ball they lose the plate. You can't. You got to. You can't be scared to let a plate flop off, because you got. Because from that spinning of those plates, from that, excuse me, from having multiple options, you gain confidence from that. You gain confidence from knowing that if this doesn't work out, or I can experiment, right? I have the freedom to experiment. Like, like most guys would not do. Uh, they wouldn't do cocky funny. They would maybe they wouldn't do a neg hit. Maybe they wouldn't even consider amuse mastery. Well, if I've got three other girls and I got another fourth one here, I might feel more comfortable in experimenting and saying, "Oh, maybe I'll try this with this girl because it doesn't matter if I win or lose. I got you know, got other options if I have to." It's the same thing as like when you get a a job. You don't ask for a raise when you're in a job if you don't have another job lined up. You have another job lined up and you go, hey, um, I, I'd like to stay here. I like the job that I have, but uh, Joe over here is offering me $10 more an hour. Um, let's deal. You don't make that. You don't have that conversation unless you've got that option already available. See, that, that's the simplistic, stupid way of talking about it. But that's, in a nutshell, you know, non-exclusivity. <laughs> uh, was it mo- I, I think it was Josh. Was it Josh Luke was saying this. Like they pay you for your dishonesty or your disloyalty. <laughs> you make more money because you're disloyal. Um, so, anyways, uh, just getting back to everything. I, I want to finish up here and then get to your your supers here in just a second. I think I have pretty much covered everything on my list. I I did want to end with uh, the idea that uh, poly is not necessarily non exclusivity because poly implies that there is a main partner. Like there's somebody that you're pretending to be monogamous with. Like it's almost like a half measure. It's like this from my experience, it's, it's, it's guys and and women too, who want to have that security. They want to have that one guy. They want to be married, but they also want to bang other people, right? They want to, um, they want to be in a relationship. They want the security. They want all of the benefits that come from that, but they don't want the obligation to just fuck that one person. That, in a nutshell, I think is what really kind of sums up poly. So how is that different from non-exclusive dating? Well, you're, and if you are spinning plates, the way I've always said, um, is don't imply exclusivity with any of them. You have 
<laughs> was it? A, it was in uh, the Breakfast Club. Remember when Bender or the, when Claire was looking through Bender's wallet and she's look she's looking at all of his the girls and his pictures in his wallet, and she goes, "Are all these your girlfriends?" And Bender says, "Some of them I consider girlfriends. Some of them I just consider." <laughs> now that that is pretty much plate theory in a couple of lines of a '80s sappy movie. Um, that's really where where this is really what's what uh what plate theory kind of amounts to is not having that main girl like guys will say well i got a main girl and i got a side piece well that's not spinning plates if you have a main girl that's not spinning plates it's it's dating non-exclusively more or less that's what it comes down to and i think that it behooves men particularly in this day and age and in the coming post virus days i think that spinning plates is something that guys are going to want to at least be comfortable in and i'm not saying like go bang you know tinder hose or whatever or get into you know go go find a sugar baby or something i'm just saying that it will you need to go into any relationship and if you if whether you decide to have a relationship with your eyes wide open and the way you can do that is to do so non-exclusively and it's not a bad thing to be non-exclusive it's not a bad thing to be non-committal it's in fact it's almost better for you to be non-committal than it is to get into a commitment that is not going to work for you because you are uneducated about the decision you were making to get into that commitment in the first place so with that said let uh, let's uh, oh and the other thing i think i said what else did i get in here uh, Oh, one last thing, um, really quickly, because a lot of guys will, I, I know this is going to be a critique because it's the mo one of the most common critiques is this. Is Rolo saying that I should just go bang as many chicks as I possibly can? What, what, what about Roosh? What about these guys who are now 40 years old and that's all they ever did and now they're, their lives are ruined and they don't know what to I'm not saying do it forever. I'm not saying spin plates forever. In fact, if you go and you look at that six-part series about spinning plates, I believe it's number six. It's either four or six. It's called Plate Theory Transitioning. And it's transitioning out of spinning plates to getting with that one girl that you think is somebody that you want to have a long-term relationship with. Don't move in with her. <laughs> not immediately. Um, but there, it's not a permanent solution. In fact, plate spinning is not really a solution. To anything it's not meant to be a solution if anything it's meant to give you an education so you can understand uh you can you can be with women and understand women's nature most guys when they're serial monogamists and they stick with it and they go through their 20s they get into their 30s it, it's inevitable that they wonder what it would have been like to fuck some other girl what uh, you see these guys one of the reasons why i see such a quote-unquote addiction to pornography right now is because it opens up the at least virtual option for men to have access, unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. That's why pornography is popular. So imagine you're the guy who idealistically got with a woman when you were 19, 20 years old, and now you find yourself 35 years old. The only girl you've ever banged is, uh, you know, uh, is your wife that you married back then, and you've only ever had sex with her. <laughs> and now you find yourself at 36, and you're sort of hitting your stride as a man, You've got more money, you've got more status, you've got more of the things that women would want. And you think, wow, if I would have just waited, if I would have just had a better, if I would have listened to Rolo, if I would have done these things, then I would be in a better position right now to be with a woman who doesn't nag me, who isn't, isn't this person that I've been with, or maybe I wouldn't have got divorced, whatever it is. And so that's another part of, of spinning plates is it's understanding the nature of women. And I've I said this all the time. Guys should not even consider monogamy until you get to be about 30 years old. And even then, have a girlfriend. Don't get married. Have a girlfriend. Because the best of your the your apex, your your peak sexual market value years have not even occurred yet. And you want to know why guys get into uh, you know what midlife crises is, and what they want to call you know it's women call it midlife crisis, but why do they get into that? It's not a a, a crisis. It's that they're realizing the game. They're realizing what they could have done is like their life that could have been had they made different decisions and that's what throws guys off that's why they that's why they go buy a ferrari or not ferrari. they go buy you know whatever it was that they wanted when they were a kid and of course women belittle them by saying oh you're just trying to recapture your youth um no i'm now 
rich enough, powerful enough, good looking enough and understand enough how the game works and how, what my part in it was. And now I want to try to find some way to maximize that. Most guys get to that point because they believed in scarcity because they didn't have an abundance mentality because they, they didn't see it coming because they were like, they still believed in, in the idealistic nature, assuming they could find a woman who would marry them back in the early days or they knock somebody up, but they get to a point where they're like, you know, why, why is it that men, you know, married men tend to be the ones who are addicted to pornography, Christian married men. Why are they the, the highest demographic of guys that are jerking off to porn all the time? Because they wonder what it's like. They want, well, I wish I had a wife who'd suck my cock. I wish I had a wife who would do these things. I wish I had, you know, that kind of stuff. And then, and here it is 24 seven, right on my, my phone, high def 4k, everything. Of course, of course they're going to, of course they're going to want to do that. So, and, and I'm not saying that they should or they shouldn't. I'm just saying those are the, the, that's the mechanics of it. So another reason why spinning plates being non-exclusive, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. It's what we talked about, talk about guys being non-exclusive and we think of them as schmucks or we think of them as like uh, players or whatever, you know, bad word you can think of. Um, but we don't say the same thing for women. Like if a woman is 36 years old and she's still unmarried and has no kids and and uh, has not saved for her future and has not prepared herself to be a good mother, blah, blah, blah. We don't we don't go and say, wow, he's she's a kiddled. We don't say she's prolonging her adolescence. No. You know what we say? She's focusing on her career. And that's OK. It's OK for her to do that. But it's not OK for a guy to do that. Why? Well, men have a burden of performance first. But second of all, it's because we want to keep men in a station of utility and the way we, the best way we can do that is to convince them that they have a soulmate that they should stick with one one chick all the time that they shouldn't ever have ac access unlimited access to unlimited sexuality pornography is bad it's an addiction for them we there's all these things that pile up on a guy so that when he gets to a point where he is useful to a woman when she is at her most necessitous that he's there and he's available and he's dumb and he has not figured this stuff out. That's what they want a guy who is women. When women get to their epiphany phase, they want a guy who's dumb. They want a guy dumb to the, to the sexual marketplace, idealistic, hopefully idealistic. You remember how the, you know, wait for me, no, wait for me. <laughs> That's what's ridiculous about the wait for me thing. Well, when we're 30 and we don't have girlfriends or boyfriends, we'll marry each other. How's that? What a great plan after I get off the carousel and you've made something of yourself. Oh, what a, what a, what a, what a great deal for him. Right. But, but there's guys that will do that. Oh, that sounds great. That sounds swell. How about we have a long distance relationship all through my twenties. And then when we're 30, we'll finally get our shit together and actually have babies. And why the woman's like, yeah, it sounds great to me. And the guy's like, yeah, it sounds great to me because and it's funny because the guy's idealistic enough and stupid enough and uneducated enough in the nature of women and the nature of game and the nature of intersexual dynamics to stick with it and actually do something. So, and make very bad decisions as a result. Okay, now I'm done. Let's go to psychedelic cyanide. Is, is Johnny from room, the room too perfect for woman? I have no idea who that dude is. Uh, Sam Whiskey says, do you think holding hands is mate guarding? Um, it can be. I, I think it just sort of depends on the context. It can be. Um, I think their body, if you want to talk about like bo body language mastery. Uh, if you want to talk about body language, uh, I've got a, a good post called body language. I don't think it's necessarily mate guarding because you hold your, you hold your girlfriend, your wife's hand. You don't like, if you, if you go into a, a club or you go into a social situation and the first thing you do is grab her hand. Like, uh, what was it? Somebody showed me that video of Meghan Markle and, um, and Prince Harry. And he was like, like they were surgically attached at the hand and he's going to talk to somebody and he's like, Holding her like this, you know, and trying to trying to hang on to her. And, and what was what was fascinating to me is when I was when I was looking at that, people were throwing that at me. I go, what do you think about this body language? Is he a, is that a beta tell? Well, yeah, I, you don't even need he's a beta. But the funny thing is, is there are so many people that were looking at that video and they would go, well, she's hanging on to him. No, he's no, she's not. She'd probably be happy to let him go. She'd probably say, yeah, go, go do whatever you're going to do. I don't have to be attached to you. It's him who's hanging on to her. 
not the other way around. But, the, but it's funny that we presume that that's what she's doing. I will guarantee you that if he let go, she would not go after him. She, it was him that was hanging on to her. That's a bit. And you want to talk about beta handholding. There you go. That's beta handholding. <laughs> there it is. Black and white. Oh, damn it. Hang on, guys. I'm going to back up a little bit here. Who else? Oh, that was. Uh, let's see. Who is Johnny from the room? I don't know. I don't know who Johnny from the room is, man. You, If you want to like educate me, I'll be happy to look at that. Now we're going to get fast and loose. Okay. Giuseppe de Fraia. It's time for Giuseppe de Fraia. He says. This oh thank you for the fifty Australian dollars is that awesome? isn't it a Australian I think it is uh, the this this is civil of women many tribes are using women as a political tool unfortunately and not helping women women are struggling with what it means to be a woman to be a woman <laughs> women have been told so many lies and their lives are complicated like career and kids well okay. Do women complicate their own lives? How hard would it be to uncomplicate a woman's life? You're going to find out very soon how uncomplex a woman can make her life. Mark my words, in the, in the post-virus world, suddenly women will become very simple creatures. They will be, oh, it's all I've ever needed was bacon pies in the kitchen, honey. You will see just how. Um, Giuseppe, I'm, you sound like a chick, man. I don't know if you're a dude. I think you're a chick. And every time you chime in, and I feel like I have to read your your chats because you give so there you fifty or hundred Australian whatever those are. So, like every time you you chat in, it's always something like, uh, you know, well, we don't want to take women's rights away. Nobody's going to take women's rights away, man. No one. It's not going to happen. The genie's out. That genie's out of that ship has sailed, man. The genie's out of the bottle. Now, maybe the virus <laughs> eventually uh, levels things off a little bit, but I wouldn't worry too much, okay? The problem that I have with all the crap that you write here, man, is that you don't see gynocentrism. You don't see the feminine primary social order, particularly in Western westernizing cultures. You need to become more aware of that. There's a separate standard of justice for women. There is a separate standard of uh, understanding like women's nature. We, in fact, we're not even encouraged to, to even believe that there is such a thing as women's nature or men's nature for that matter too. Um, what are women struggling with? Certainly not having kids. Certainly not, um, you know, having kids is, a, is a, uh, an entitlement in a feminine primary social order, you know? You don't even have to have a guy. Men are basically superfluous to, to women right now. So what do they have to struggle with? Yeah. Explain to me what you think women are struggling with. It's not money. They are the primary consumers, and certainly in Western societies. You know, they're not struggling with anything. Not, and I've never said take their rights away from them. I've just said, you, can, you know what? Women should be able to do whatever the hell they want to do, as long as those consequences for what they do is not transferred over to the guys. That's what I'm saying, because that's the way it works right now. Uh, we have men have zero authority and 100 percent responsibility. It would be nice if we saw something balance out, hopefully in a post virus world. Wouldn't that be great? Or men actually reclaim some sort of responsibility or reclaim some sort of authority over their family, authority over their children, authority over, you know, the directions of their lives. So I don't I, sorry, I don't see it that way, man woman i don't know what you are um who else sam thank you so you know what dude i don't thank you enough man sam i appreciate it i appreciate, it. I appreciate you um sam is always my my moderator sam bada is also the voice of all of my audiobooks so if you haven't matter of fact if you haven't got an audiobook you should get one now because what else are you gonna do you're if you haven't enjoyed my voice for the last two hours why not listen to it for another 14 on the first book <laughs> or actually on sam's voice for the next um uh, thank you sam thanks especially in this time um i hope you guys have liked this i'm going to uh oh, i gotta catch up here oh, i'm sorry I'm, um you are my father figure dad died when i was two um, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I can, 
I don't, I don't think of myself as a father figure. I guess maybe I am to some guys, but uh, an educator. Let's just say that. I'm the best teacher you ever had. Let's just, how about that? I'm the professor. Dr. Rolo Tomasi Emeritus, honorary diploma. And uh, what else is here? Uh, let's see, I talked to Giuseppe. Giuseppe the Friar. Oh, here we go. Uh, Juan Sebastian says, for somebody who didn't learn the necessary skills, experience growing up and unplugged late, what are some good pointers? Um, okay. Jeez. <laughs> I, okay, let's just say this. Uh, first and foremost, you need to learn um, mental point of origin. You already knew I was going to say that, so let's go with that. Especially in a post-virus world, that is going to be your number one most important priority for all men right now. Become your mental point of origin. Under, you know, people are going to, what's going to happen right now? And, and this is uh, regarding your question here. I'll give you some points. What's going to happen in a post virus world? What you're going to see, I think, probably within the next maybe two weeks, if, if not sooner, you're going to see guys or you're going to see women telling men that it is their responsibility to take care of them. That men, you're going to see uh, uh, sort of a brow beating. It, will, it might come in the form of, well, we really appreciate our men now, but it's going to be, you guys need to step up. You men have responsibilities to us. You men have to, you know, save us from the rising floodwaters. You men have to insert the, insert whatever in the blank. That's what it'll end up being is, is it will be a plea. It'll be an appeal to responsibility. And when that happens, what you need to say is great. What authority do I have? What do I, how, you know, how do I, you know, it's not what do I get for that responsibility? It's how am I empowered by that responsibility? How can I be responsible? How can you trust me to be responsible if you cannot trust me to be an authority? That's what, that's the question that needs to be thrown back in women's faces when they say this. And it will happen. It's coming right now. Oh, men need to help us out. You know, the economy fell apart. Uh, Karen in HR doesn't have a job anymore. You need to, you men need to step up and fix all this and put us back where we were. I, I, I realize probably a lot of MGTOWs right now are going, oh, this is great. It's a dream come true. Finally, women are going to be nice to us. No, they're not. They're going to go back to doing exactly what they've done before. Um, you're going to see them twist in the wind for a while, for sure. <laughs> But it's it, this isn't the big get even. So, um, and you will see that when the idea of responsibility and personal responsibility to to home and hearth and women and church and state and everything else, because you, I will guarantee you, that's where we're going. It will be a an appeal to men's sense of honor and duty and responsibility. That will be the next thing. That's my prediction. Quote me on that. We will be going to, we'll be relying on men and they will be leaning, women will be, well, women and other men will be leaning on men with the, the big, heavy honor, duty, and responsibility stick very soon. Keep that in mind. Um, so uh, let's see, what did you say here? I'm sorry, I have to go back here a second. Uh, for somebody who didn't learn necessary skills and experience. Well, man, I, I, I'm, I'm of the opinion and it's never too late. Okay, I have guys that I counsel who are 70 years old, who are looking back on a life where they had made the, the, the result where they're at in life right now at 70 was is the result of their never having woken up, of never having uh, made the decisions according to accurate information. Here's the thing, Juan, you have accurate information. Use it. Stay on top of it. Uh, use it to direct your life. Like, you know, he said, I, I don't know you personally, so I can't really, I mean, unless I did a, a counseling thing with you, I could probably do it, but, um, you know, necessary skills. Well, I don't, what's a necessary skill to you? Do you have a job? Um, do you, are you, what's your ambitions? Where do you want to go in life? What do you want to do with yourself? This is why I don't give blanket prescriptions to guys. There's some, you know, how do I learn those things? Well, you know, you start with the basics. You start with like, you know, making yourself your own mental point of origin, understanding the the nature of men and women, understanding the nature of yourself. Um, you know, what do you making decisions for yourself and deciding where you want to go? Uh, I, I've always said that it's not about like a search for meaning. It's about guys having a purpose and finding some something to do with themselves. 
you can go find meaning wherever you want, but like you finding a purpose is something that guy, every guy has to do understand you have a burden of performance, right? You're going to be judged based on your performance. You know, I don't care what other people say. Oh, yes, you do. And in fact, you wouldn't be having that conversation. Everybody cares what everybody else thinks about them. I don't care how maverick and individualist you think you are. It's an, in some day, some way, uh, you get up in the morning and you talk to your mom on the phone. You care what she thinks. If you if you don't care what you th anybody thinks about you, then what do you wear? Then what do you wear to a wedding? What do you wear to a, a, a job interview? What do you wear to a funeral? You do. You do care about what people think. And there's nothing wrong with that. You just have to be somebody who can excel at that and accepting in that. Um, let's see what else. I, uh, Carl says, you're my father figure. Thanks, man. Thanks. Son. Uh, <laughs> Domen low. Domen low. Says, How would one deal with overt push for exclusivity by a plate though? Suggestions on reframing. Okay. Um, Domen, I have a post. It's called the talk. I didn't get to it in this because it's kind of a, it almost probably deserves another, uh, like ha it deserves half a show, but the talk is this. The talk is when a woman comes up to you and she says, where is this going? Where are we going? What are we doing? What are we? What am I to you? Have you heard any of these before? What am I to you? Um, can I make us official on Facebook? Uh, my mom wants to know, are you going to marry me? <laughs> the passive aggressive, right? Um, where are we going? How, how is this going? At, at, when, when you have, when you're a high value guy, when you're the guy that other women will share, at some point, one of those chicks is going to want to push all the rest of those bitches off the off the mountain, right? They want to push her off, push them off the list. And so, what they'll do is they'll have they'll have the talk. And again, I've written actually a pretty long essay about this called the talk. And it's when women push for exclusivity. That is when you need to make a decision. That's when you have to pull a trigger. A trigger is this: Do I want to stay with this chick? And you need to be able to dissociate yourself from the feelings you have for her. If you have any, you need to dissociate yourself from, if she's a hot chick, if she's beautiful, you need to dissociate yourself from that. And you need to dissociate yourself from the good sex. If assuming you did have good sex with this girl and you need to make a good, long, rational decision about whether or not you want to, it's, it's, it's go time. It's shit or get off the pot. Do you want to stick with her or do you not want to stick with her? And that's really kind of up to the guy and like where you're at in life, what's your age is like, what are the other girls that you're with that kind of stuff. Um, so it's, it's kind of up to you. Now, the other thing is this is because she had that talk, she is inst instigating frame her own frame. So if you acquiesce, if you go, okay, I guess you're right. Even if she's the chick that you want to be with, even if you actually have made a, like I said, this needs to be a whole show to itself. But even if you decide, Hey, I really want to be with this girl, whatever, tell her no. Tell her no right then and there and not to, not to piss her off, not to do anything, but because you need, to, if you're going to get with her, it needs to be on your terms. It needs to be in your frame. You need to drag her into your frame. If a woman is having that, that the talk with you, you're out of your frame right there. It's an ultimate. The talk is usually an ultimatum, but if you're, ha if she comes up to you and she has the quote unquote talk with you, understand that that is an initiation of her frame. I'm not getting any younger. Usually when women have the talk, it's because they're with a guy who's good enough. And that's something you need to, to assess. Is she also, is she, is she breaking rules for you or is she making rules for you? Because if she has the talk and she wants to be exclusive and she wants to, where is this going? That's a rule. You don't see it as a rule at that time, but that's a rule. The rule is this. I'm not going to fuck you anymore until you acquiesce to my frame. And in any time that happens from any woman, whether you're whether that's your wife of 20 years, you walk away, you you resist that frame grab because that's what that is is a frame grab. And then you need to ask yourself why is she trying to get a frame grab? Like what what did I do that would make her think that she could, you know, in, in, like give me an ultimatum? What what is what is the what are the conditions of my relationship with this person that she felt comfortable in giving me the talk? I'm the one that gives you the talk. I'm the one that says, hey, I want, this is where I want to go with this. You're with me. Comply or goodbye. That's what she's saying. Because she's giving you that, that the, the Tate speech, right? Comply or goodbye. So keep that in mind, man. When you get the talk, that's a frame grab. Uh, let's see. Carl Bennington. Uh, ever read Men Are From Mars? Yes, I have. God. Uh, 
Thank God he was only a 199 one because I really don't want to talk about men are from Mars. Um, I didn't really like, uh, was it John Gray? I think it, I, I think John Gray is highly overrated. Um, I when it when it's like men are from Mars, women from Venus. Um, I think in the terms of men and women are different, that's great. But it's all woo woo magical. It's like David Dita stuff, man. It's like it's like um, or David Dita dated David D'Angelo. It's it's woo woo magical thinking is what it is. Uh, yes, men and women are different. I, he's got a point. Great. Okay. But from there, it's all Oprah, you know, Church of Oprah stuff. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I'm saying that there's not any value in it. I just don't, I, it's dated material and it's all based on very supernatural, like I said, magical thinking. Uh, Yellow says, hi again. Uh, when women choose to settle down, did I have that here? Let me see. All right. Damn it, I lost it again. Okay, here we go. Uh, when women choose to settle down with a beta provider because of necessity, will she have to force herself to give him X's, e X E S, or does she enjoy it? Will she have to give him X's? I don't know what the fuck X's are, yellow. I think you mean... Will she have to give him fucking or something? Sex? Sex? Is that? Oh, give him sex. Oh, you spelled it backwards. Ha! Huh, now I get it. Uh, we uh, will. She have to force herself to give him sex, or does she enjoy it? Uh, I think she probably. I think in the beginning, when if a woman is, if you're the good enough guy, if you're the Plan B guy, if you're the guy that she says, "Well, I I have to check this off my list. Uh, I have to get married before I'm 30." You'll do. It's not that she wants to marry you. She wants to get married. And usually what happens during the epiphany phase is there's a conversation that women have, internal conversation, where a woman will say, okay, uh, the, her id and her ego are, are talking to each other. And the id says, I really want to go bang those, those hot alpha guys that we got with um, back in our college days. It was so much fun. How can we find those guys? Let's go, let's go get with those guys. They're so hot. I love their bodies, blah, 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 blah. Well, the ego says, well, we're 30 years old now, and they're not as forthcoming anymore. We're not as hot as we used to be, and we really need to find someone because uh, long-term security, babies, uh, family, blah, 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 blah. And the id, id says, no, 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 no. I want to have sex with these guys. They're, they're, that's what I'm after. I want to have sex with those guys. And the ego says, no, 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 no. We got to find something that's going to you know, be a good long-term option for us. And those hot guys that you had back in your you know, college days, um, and when you were so wild, um, they're not as forthcoming and they don't want to settle down and they don't want to wife you up and they'll, they'll never, they're commitment phobic. Right. <laughs> and the id says, no, 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 no. I want to have sex with them. I, I, let's just keep, well, we, we can do it. Let's, let's try to find a way. I I've heard that our sexual prime is at 40. No problem. We can still keep doing this. And the ego says, no, 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 no. We have to find an, a, a, the right guy. Well, what about this beta over here? Okay. Well, we'll do things the right way. Okay, we got to get right with God. Okay, well, he's not fun. He's not as exciting as those guys. Oh, but we have to. He's got a good job. He's a he's going to be an attorney someday. Um, he's still stupid. He's 31 years old. He doesn't understand the sexual marketplace for himself. He's just happy to have the girl like, you know, wink at him. So what about him? No, 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 no. I want to go have sex with those fun guys that I had sex with when I was 23. No, we got to do something here. So eventually they have this conversation. And at some point there's a compromise that's made in a woman's ego and her id. And it's made on the guy who best fits the bill with the hope that maybe at some point he will be exciting. that He will learn how to master women that he will get experience, even though he had probably hasn't, he's been a serial monogamous, like I was saying. Um, and so what happens is women will make that decision on the plan B guy have babies with that guy later on anywhere between seven and 12 years later. Um, so let me say the seven year itch, right. Or something between the ages of like seven years and then like 20 years, I think is the next, the, the demographic statistically, those are the years in a marriage that you're most likely to get divorced. That's why they call it the seven year itch, right? Seven year itch is like, okay, well, woman, it's guys like we, we throw the seven year itch at men because they think that, well, you know, once a, once a man has had sex with a chick and they've had some babies together at said, by the time that kid is seven years old, it, evolutionarily speaking, that kid should be self-sufficient and the guy can move away from that 
monogamous situation and go bang other women and start to have other families. Whereas it's woman's, it's a woman's in a woman's best interest that she keep that guy there with value added. That's the way it used to work in the old order. Now in the new order, women don't give a shit. The, the new order works this way. Who's going to support this kid? Who's going to support me? Not you. Great. The state will. Great. Um, you know, I can divorce you and 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 have alimony and child support until he's eighteen. It's we. Uh, Dal Rock has always said we've moved away from a marriage based way of raising kids to a child support based model of raising kids, and that's how it works now. But it didn't used to work that way. It used to be. It used to be in women's best interests to maintain a marriage, to to keep the guy happy, to keep him around because that was a good deal. Now it's incentivized for her to not do that. So, um, let's see what else. Sorry, Yolo. Uh, Rolo's hair. Rem- oh, here it is. Rolo's hair reminds me of Snowflame. Who's Snowflame? Is that the uh, is that the Asian karate guy with the long white hair and he's got the long Fu Manchu? Is that the dude? And he's got the white uh, the white eyebrows. I've seen pictures of that guy. People keep telling me that my hair looks like the Witcher. I think that I think that's what I'm going to go for is a Witcher. It's the only one I know really, or Elric, Elric of Melba Melnebone. Right? I don't know how to pronounce that. I love Elric. I love the Elric series of books. Now you guys can ask me stupid personal questions. All right, I'm almost done. Uh, what is this? This is got two requests on Bumble, both 35. One is hot. Awesome. Spin them. Spin them, dude. Spin more plates. A lot of a lot of guys will say, "Well, you know, I can't believe that I have to. I'm, I'm. Should I do this? Is this beta? Did I do that? I can't. I don't know about my relationship. Blah blah blah. You know what the answer is? Spin more plates. You know how you you know how you decide whether or not you should break up with your girlfriend or not? Spin more plates. <laughs> Develop more options. When I in one of the and I was talking about this last week. Um, uh, Iron Rule of Tomasi number seven: Never root through garbage when. Uh, after you've taken the trash can to the curb because what you thought was valuable, what you thought you could find in that garbage is not there or it's not what you thought it was. And it is always time better spent developing new relationships than it is to try to repair an old failed relationship because the girls that the girls plural that you get with, I don't know anything about you. You're starting over. It's a fresh, fresh page of P- and piece of paper. So it's always better to to get with a new girl than it is to go back with the old one because there will always be that time where you guys broke up and there'll always be the reason why you broke up. You know, whether she dumped you or you dumped her, or you had to beg her to come back or she had to beg you to come back. There's, you know, it's ugly either way. But it's better in your best interests. So and this is un, relates to what today's topic, spin more plates, have more options. You don't get into those situations if you have more options. Okay, Carl, here we go. Didn't your wife have the talk with you? How did it, how did you maintain frame? Okay, I'll explain to you what happened. My wife did not have the talk with me. Um, we were not exclusive for a long time. Uh, I was, yeah, that long time. I was, I was, I dated my wife non-exclusively. My wife actually taught me how to date non-exclusively. Um, there was a time when I was in my, my rock star 20s where I was, I, you know, I was talking about my 40 notch count, 40 plus notch count. Um, where I was, I got so good at my personal game that I could more or less go out on a Friday evening, uh, if I was, if, whereas I was a gig or not and pretty much pull and, and go home. And I, and many times the same night lay, if not like the next following week lay, um, I could do that. And then I got into the situation with the, um, the, the borderline personality disordered girlfriend. And then when I got out of that, I decided that I was, that was when I really kind of focused on mental point of origin, right? I didn't know, I didn't call it then. I was just thinking, oh, think for me, I got to make my own decisions and put me first kind of thing. That's what I was thinking at the time. And so it was about that time after I broke up with her that I started dating non-exclusively. Um, I, at the time I was with Mrs. Tomas, who is now Mrs. Tomasi. Uh, she was one girl amongst three at that time. In fact, as a matter of fact, my, my wife is a, a healthcare. I'm, I shouldn't tell you this story. My wife is a healthcare professional. I'm not going to tell you what she does, but she was working at a hospital at the time. And one of the other girls that was my my plates was actually working at the same hospital. <laughs> and they knew about each other. And they knew that I was that I was seeing both of them at the same time. And I thought I screwed up. 
Like I, I thought, oh my, because I still, I didn't understand this stuff. I, I wasn't, it's not like I was proudly doing all this stuff. I was just came natural to me because I'd done it before, right? I was double shifting. I, there's times where I would have sex twice in the same day with a different girl. I think I've never had a, I've never had a three way, but I've all, I have had, I have double shifted and, and triple shifted um, back in my early twenties. I have done that. So one at a time. Yes. But, um, so anyways, um, and that's not a cope and that's not a gloss or whatever. I'm just telling you what it's got. So, so I'm, I'm with her. I'm with the, uh, this other girl. I won't tell you about her, but the, so I'm with the, the two girls that are at my wife and the, um, the other girlfriend that's at the, uh, at the hospital. Uh, they knew about each other. Um, there was a time where we were, sp- <laughs> there was a time where we were supposed to go to this, like, um, to this, uh, it was a, a hospital thing and a fire department thing. And it was like a, like a potluck or something like that. And I had to decide which one <laughs> I had to decide which one I was going to go with. And so I took Mrs. Tomasi cause she was the hottest amongst all of them. And we were dating non-exclusively for a long time. Cause I knew she was, she was still dating some guys who were like, and I think it was a radiologist was one of the guys that she was dating. Like some guys who had made a lot more money than I did. I was just a, you know, a Yahoo musician. Right. I, I mean, I had a, job but like it wasn't I certainly wasn't making that kind of money and she chose me she wanted to be with me she she one time i think it was after we had had sex she says i don't like the idea of you having sex with other girls and i wasn't a talk it wasn't like where is this going she just said i don't like the idea of you having sex with other girls i want i want you to myself basically and that was good for me because it still maintained a frame but it also maintained natural desire, like a, a uh, uh, not transactional so much as a, as validational. She wanted me to herself, and she just that was just the way things goes. And I said, you know, she was the hottest amongst the three that I was with at that time. And I was honestly, you know, me being thinking as a guy, that's what I was doing. I was like, okay, fine, I'd be happy to keep mailing you because this is fun and I like it, and I liked her and I liked her ass. <laughs> so um, and things worked out, right? I met my wife at a club um, after a gig. Actually, I wasn't even playing. It was a, a friend of mine's band that was playing at the time. And I met her. Um, she was on a girl's night out, right? So you're not supposed to meet girls. You don't meet quality girls at a club. You meet them at church and at Barnes and Noble. I know. I mean, you, know you don't know. You, you, you build a relationship. You don't fucking find a relationship. So so that's that's kind of like how things worked out for me when it came to oh i saw your picture man thanks snow flame i'm gonna have to look up snow flame after this show i'm gonna go check that out um okay so that was that and um let's see isn't that poly open if you guys didn't date exclusively no i i just said that dude i richard uh go back and look and, and rewind the tape a little bit i was just talking about how poly is different from that i wasn't banging i was i was hitting her i was getting with her but i wasn't pretending she was my girlfriend and she wasn't pretending to be my boyfriend either because I knew she was with other guys. So I was like, okay, you know, I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. I'm going to date non-exclusively. And then she came to me. So that's fine. Uh, let's see what else you got here. Best way to tune a Floyd Rose. Uh, here's how you tune a Floyd Rose. Okay. What you got to do is you got to crack open the, the, the lock nut because usually on a Kramer, there's a lock nut. Okay, here's your process. You know, they tell you and and YouTube is like, if you want to do a successful video, you have to do a process. Okay, here's a process. You open the lock nut at the at the upper end. And then what you do is you take all the little screws at the bottom. (laughs) You guys are going to get that. This is the end. Okay, so you guys, if you want to tune out, fine. But uh, the the little screws and the fine tuners, you got to not go all the way. Well, you got to go all the way down and then about halfway up for all of them and then tune it at the keys and then tune the keys. And lock the lock nut down and then retune it, but then use the fine tuners to just get it like perfectly in tune. And the best thing, the reason why Floyd Rose has lasted the te- test of time is because it's a badass tremolo system. There you go. So there's your there's your guitar tech thing. Would you guys like okay? So okay, I'm done. If you want to bail out, I'm gonna give you the the housekeeping right now um please subscribe to this channel uh also if you have not heard if you are not a patreon subscriber if you are a ticket holder for rule zero live we have had to postpone it until october uh there are details uh for the people who are ticket holders uh because only patreon subscribers uh can be ticket holders 
So if you need details on that, you can always email me about it. We are postponing it until October 2nd through the 4th. So that is a Friday, a Saturday, and a Sunday. The second is the Friday. Saturday is the third. The fourth is a Sunday. We're going to have, we've expanded the conference. Um, we're going to have a second day of conferences. Um, I'll, my, all of us in Rule Zero will probably be on the first day, unless, unless we mix things up a little bit, but we're probably going to do exactly what we were going to do um, in April. Obviously, we can't because Vegas is completely shut down. Uh, also, uh, Canada, the travel between Canada is closed for at least a month, so that screws us. And then also, uh, the UK has closed, or the US has closed off from the UK as well, so that screws us with Troy. So we have no choice. Um, I don't, I didn't want to do this, but that's what we have to do. Um, so we're postponing it. There's more details if you are curious about like refunds. I'm happy to give you a full refund, but. Before you ask for one, please go look at the details of this. We will make a bigger announcement, of course, probably around like June or something, like what we're planning to do. And we want to see how things shake out with the virus and all that stuff. So so go check that out. We're expanding the, the speakers to a second day. So we're going to have more speakers. Aaron Clary is already confirmed. So we got him on the roster right now. We're probably going to have, I would say, another five guys, maybe, maybe another five guys. And then that Sunday... Um, is we're going to have our talks and do all the stuff that we were going to do anyways in April. So that Sunday will be open for like kind of like extracurricular activity. So if you bought tickets from me, you can come to my thing and I'm working with Ryan. So if you bought tickets from Ryan, you can come to our, you know, our talks and our like casual get togethers and stuff all on, on, on the same ticket. Um, and then whatever Rich and the rest of these guys do on their own talk to them. If you bought tickets to them, talk to them. But that's pretty much what we're doing with Rule Zero Live right now. We got no choice. I, I, I really hate this. I really fucking hate this. So um, that's what's going on there. Um, I'm really digging into book four. The one bright spot in all this, I can't even, you know, it's funny. It's like, I, even if I was done with the book right now, which I'm, I'm getting done through second rounds of edits, I should be done in a little bit but i even if it was done right now and ready to go the printer i can't do anything because the printing play like it's fucking me with uh with print i mean uh, kindle still works if you want to buy a book but you want to help me out right now go buy kindle go buy my kindle books <laughs> because the the print books right now are on hold because those plants are closed and there's nothing i can do about it so um like even if I had, even if it was ready to go, I'm still prepping it. And I know uh, Sam Bot is going to be reading. I'm, I'm going to be sending Sam. If you're still watching, I'm going to be sending you um, uh, chapter by chapter so you can start working on the Audible book. So we'll be ready when they're ready. But there's nothing I can really do about it right now. So except for focus on it and really s stick with my work. Uh, one last thing, uh, I finally got a vlogging kit for my GoPro Hero Seven Black. And I'm going to be doing, because I have lots of time, I'm going to be doing um, one, like, quick hit videos. They will be between, like, five and seven minutes long. Um, if you guys have something that you want me to talk about in those videos, I'm happy to, as long as they're related to, you know, Red Pill stuff, they're, they're related to the books, that's fine. I'll be happy to, to use those. I've got some ideas already, but if you if there's something you think that I, I can do, like, a real quick summation in, like, a five or seven minute video, I probably would do that, too, so... Um, so that is it. Thank you guys for watching today. I'm going to go look up who the fuck Snowflame is right now. And um, let's see. Oh, Wednesday. Wednesday, I'll be back, of course, uh, same time. Oh, and last but not least, I want you guys to see this. This is going to be really cool. Wait till you see this. See this guy right here? That's Ned. I'm going to go get Ned. I'm going to go pick up Ned if I can. If, I, if California's not completely shut down, I'm going to go pick up Ned probably this week. Probably middle of this week. If I'm not doing a show on Wednesday, it'll be because I'm driving down to go get Ned. Um, he's going to, he's like a perfect uh, two and a half year old boy that I think will fit very nicely with my girl. Um, as you know, uh, Henry passed away uh, last Thursday. And, um, it's really particularly in the, the the lockdown it's really hard to find grays but i this is a good opportunity and i really like them and i i got other pictures too but just i thought he was really cool so i wanted to show you guys so there you go <laughs>
Thanks, guys. Thanks for watching. And I will see you guys on Wednesday, hopefully. Okay. Uh, be safe. Be clean. Um, don't put your dick in crazy. Bye.